Um, well, I'm going to call this meeting of October 6, 2022 to order. And um, should we do a roll call first? Commissioner Conway, Dawson, Kennedy, Maxwell. Here. C.D. Miller. Here. Different. Here. Vice Chair Greenberg. Here. Thank you. Uh, so uh, now, um, does anyone want to move to approve the minutes or have any discussion about the minutes from our last meeting? I think we should start with oral communications. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I have that in the wrong order. Yes. And also, and if there are any statements. Oh, of sorry, excuse me. I'm not looking in the right order. My apologies. First, statements of disqualification. Are there any statements of disqualification for our meeting today? Okay. So now I'm going to go to oral communications. Um, and I would like to ask if uh, there are any members of the public wishing to speak on an item that is not before the commission this evening. I do see a member of the public has indicated they wish to speak. Wonderful. Okay. So please um, have three minutes to speak on an item not before the commission this evening. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. My name is Brian Shields. I'm a field rep for Carpenters Local 505 in APSA. And uh, I wanted to just take a moment tonight to touch on the need for labor standards. Um, these standards are the escalator for the working class. By Santa Cruz adopting apprenticeship health care prevailing wage, they would ensure the working class is placed here in our community. It is necessary to not only meet our need for housing, but also to secure the position of the working class here. Apprenticeship is a proven escalator to uh, help people in, uh, in continuing a career, to stay with a, a particular career, not to jump from one industry to the next, thereby securing a workforce for us moving forward. Healthcare is necessary, not just for the worker, but also for the family so that the entire family is able to, to speak and see uh, uh, doctors and physicians as needed, uh, thereby taking the stress off the workforce. And prevailing wage, uh, Santa Cruz is an expensive town to live in, and, uh, and it's necessary to, to earn a good wage in order to live here and spend our tax dollars here. Um, and, and bring that money back into Santa Cruz so that we can continue to build. Anyways, I didn't want to take too much of your time tonight. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And, uh, and I look forward to hopefully engaging with the Planning Commission more. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Mr. Shields, for that, for that comment. Really appreciate it. And um, are there any other members of the public who wish to speak to the Commission this evening on a matter not actually on the agenda um, before the commission tonight. Okay. Well, seeing none, I think we're going to move on to uh, what I mentioned before, which is the approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Is there any discussion, any question about any uh, items uh, within the minutes or are we ready to approve the minutes? I'll move the minutes, but you might want to ask if any members of the public are here to talk about the minutes. Are there any members of the public who would like to talk about the minutes, not just people on the uh, on the commission? I see no hands. No hands. Okay. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, uh, I'll I'll move approval of the minutes. Okay. Oh, sorry, Sean. We can't hear you. My space bar is not working. I'd like to second that. Okay, great. So um, can we get a, a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Kennedy? I abstain. I wasn't there. Maxwell? Aye. Lassiti Miller? I'll abstain. I wasn't present. Different? Aye. Uh, Greenberg? Aye. Thank you. Okay, so I think the minutes pass. Yes. 
Uh, yes? Yes. Okay. So um, thank you. And um, so we're going to move on now to uh, the uh, discussion before us uh, in our public hearing. And I would like to um, first open it to the public to speak. Uh, I think the staff report comes first. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. That would make sense. Okay. We're going to go to the staff report and then we're going to ask the public to speak. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Commissioner, um, Chair tonight, Greenberg, and um, good evening, Planning Commissioners. Um, let me go ahead and pull up my presentation. And. Okay, can. Wait. It's not right. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Give me a second. Share screen would help. Everyone can see it? Yes. Okay. So um, tonight we're looking at a non-residential demolition authorization permit, a sequential lot line adjustment, a special use permit, a coastal permit, design permit, and heritage tree removal permit to reconfigure the site into two lots, remove six heritage trees, demolish two vacant school buildings, and construct a senior um, housing facility comprised of assisted living and memory care units. This project also requires a historic alteration permit as it is listed on the city's historic building survey. The historic alteration permit was approved by the Historic Preservation Commission at their August 17th hearing. Applicant also held two community meetings for this project, one on March 3rd and one on May 28th of 2020. At these meetings, the applicant presented earlier concepts of the project. Feedback from the community included concerns about project size, traffic and parking, compatibility with residences on Eucalyptus Avenue, setbacks to residences, unit affordability, impacts to heritage trees and monarch butterflies, construction impacts on the neighborhood, noise from emergency vehicle visits, and the effect of the project on the surrounding property values. I want to note that tonight's project is substantially smaller than the initial concepts that were shown at the community meeting. So the project site is low is located on the lower west side of Santa Cruz um, at the corner of Pelton Avenue and Westcliff Drive. Um, there are single family homes to the north and to the west. White House Field State Park is to the south. And we have Cliff Drive and the Pacific Ocean to the east. There are currently six buildings on the site. I have them labeled here on the screen. Buildings one, two, and three are two carriage house, and these buildings are listed in the city's historic building survey. Building number four is the Shrine of St. Joseph, Guardian of the Redeemer. That's the church. Buildings five and six are educational buildings that were most recently used by the Gateway School until 2019, and they're now vacant. There are also several heritage trees on the property. So the proposal will reconfigure the site into two lots, one on the west part of the site and one on the east. I'm sorry, west and then east. Um, the eastern lot will keep buildings one through four, which are the church building and the three historic buildings. On the western lot, the proposal is to demolish the two school buildings and to construct a senior assisted living and memory care facility. So here's a layout of the proposed development. The facility is a two-story building with 76 units, including 59 assisted living units, 15 memory care units, and two inclusionary, aka affordable, units that are required to be designated either as assisted living, independent living, or staff housing. The project also includes um, several amenity spaces, including a cafeteria, multi-purpose room, fitness room, salon, lounge, and then operational spaces such as offices and backup house functions. Um, this proposal is consistent with several gener general plan housing element policies, 
um, that support the development of units for elderly individuals and for those with special needs. The site is zoned R15, which is a single family residential zone district. Um, and so this type of development requires approval of a special use permit and a design permit for a community care facility. The site is also located in coastal exclusion zone B and the appealable area of the coastal zone. So the project requires a coastal permit um, that is appealable to the coastal commission. Because the project involves demolition of the two school buildings um, that are more than 50 years old, the project requires approval of a non-residential demolition authorization permit. The project also involves configuring five legal lots into two. So this requires approval of a sequential lot line adjustment permit. And then finally, a heritage tree removal permit is required to remove the six heritage or six of the heritage trees on the site. Okay, so I'm gonna start talking a little bit about the project design. This is a view of the project from um, Pelton Avenue from the south, um, showing the parking lot and then the main entrance to the building. The building has a Mediterranean architectural style with flat roof lines, arched entryways, um, white stucco, bronze colored windows, copings and other details, um, wood awning and trellis features, and terracotta colored attic vents. Um, so one thing the Historic Preservation Commission did when they approved their permit, um, in order to ensure that the quality of materials on this development is comparable to that of the historic resources on the site, um, the commission approved a few conditions, uh, and those include uh, requiring windows to be baked enamel aluminum or stained wood, um, for the windows to be recessed at least three inches, and for the stucco to be hard travel smooth finish. And those conditions are also included um, in the conditions of approval for the design permit tonight. Um, as you can see, well, you can kind of see, um, they're proposing a very well landscaped parking area um, and they have a nice um, covered uh, trellis walkway that kind of breaks up the massing of the parking lot. On the right side of the screen, um, you can see the proposed trash enclosure. It's behind this big tree that they're showing on the right. And then you can also see um, a service gate extending from the right side of the building um, over to the, I guess, over to the property line. Um, I have included conditions of approval to ensure that these two features have matching materials um, and design features um, to make them consistent with the rest of the site. This is the south elevation drawing that corresponds to the rendering we just looked at. Um, and I just wanted to show this um, because I'm proposing a couple other conditions of approval. Um, one of them is you can see a rooftop trellis here on the right side of the elevation. This exceeds the height limitation for the zone district. So there's a condition of approval for this to be removed from the building permit plans. Um, the elevation is also showing a chimney, um, which didn't seem to relate to any fireplaces in the building below. It seems to be a faux, uh, like decorative architectural feature. The zoning ordinance allows chimneys to exceed the building height, but it does not allow architectural features to exceed the building height. So a condition of approval requires the building permit plans to either remove the chimney or to show that it's actually a functional chimney. This is the view of the project from Eucalyptus Avenue. Um, you can see the architectural style is consistent with flat roof lines, um, the bronze colored detailing um, and wooden awning and trellis features. The massing on this side um, is in the form of building segments broken up with um, courtyards and a lot of landscaping in the front. Um, I think the intent here is it, the massing is similar to um, that of single family homes um, with the spacing in between the homes. And that makes it consistent with the single family homes on the other side of Eucalyptus Street. Okay, here we have the north side of the building. Um, these are gonna be memory care units. And this side of the building is adjacent to single family homes uh, to the north of the project site. Um, this generally will not be visible from the public right of way. Again, the architectural style is consistent with the other elevations. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the rooftop trellis and the chimney shown here um, 
will be required to be removed, the chimney may be um, for exceeding the zone district height. This is the view from the east. Um, I have it broken up because it's a very long view, but basically the top, you start at the left on the top and then you skip down to the bottom. Um, this is um, the view basically from Westcliff Drive, except it's not very visible from Westcliff Drive because it's behind the existing church buildings and historic buildings. And there's a lot of vegetation on this site. So this is very um, well shielded. You'll be able to see some of it, but not a lot. Um, this area in the front on the left side of the elevation is the service area. This is mostly blocked by the church building and there's also going to be a six foot wall. So none of that is going to be visible from Westcliff Drive. Okay, I'm going to jump in and um, talk a little about, about our inclusionary requirement here. So the city's inclusionary ordinance requires 20% of the dwelling units in a development to be offered at an affordable rent to low income households. So on the screen, I'm showing the zoning ordinance's definition of a dwelling unit. Um, as you can see, one of the defining components of a dwelling unit is that it has a food preparation facility, AKA a kitchen. Um, the zoning ordinance further defines kitchen as a room or portion of room designed to be used for cooking and or preparation of food and containing two or more of appliances and or fixtures. And then those appliances and fixtures are detailed in the definition. So this development has 76 assisted living and memory care units. However, most of these units only have either a kitchenette or they don't have um, any kind of kitchen facilities at all. Only 13 of the units are proposed to have full kitchens. And so therefore, um, those are considered the full dwelling units in the project. And the 20% inclusionary ratio only applies to those 13 units. 20% of 13 is 2.6, which then rounds down to two units as required by the ordinance. So I've included a condition um, of approval requiring the units without full kitchens to be memorialized as such. Um, if the applicant wants to increase the number of full units with kitchens in the future, they would need to obtain a modification to the permit and then comply with um, the inclusionary requirements for all of the full dwelling units on the project. I'm going to start talking about some different um, resources here. So first, Can I interrupt you and ask a question about the dwelling unit? Um, Definition. I suppose so. I guess as chair, um, I should say um, that's okay. I think that is that okay with you, um, Planner Stanger, that uh, we have questions? Just to uh, clarify, is this a clarifying question? Yeah, it's just to, uh, specific to the that slide. Okay. Because the, it's a clarifying um, question. The language in the ordinance on a um, food preparation facility says any portion, any room or portion of a room. And it would seem to me that those units that were had kitchenettes, one could argue were potentially portions of a room that have two or more of these facilities. So I'm just wondering how many kitchenettes there are. I understand that there are 13 with full kitchens, but how many have kitchenettes and do the kitchenettes meet the um, language in the, the, the requirements in the ordinance for having two or more of the facilities? Sure. Off the top of my head, I don't recall exactly how many kitchenettes there are, but I do know that the kitchenettes do not um, rise to the definition of kitchen in that they do not have at least two of the appliances listed in the definition. And the condition of approvals, the conditions of approval limit them to not rise to that definition of a full kitchen. Sorry, and how many appliances would they need? Uh, so they would need at least two. So they need um, they need at least being, um, any sink larger than 14 inches by 14 inches and or having a drain outlet larger than one and a half inches in diameter, a refrigerator larger than two and a half cubic feet, a hot plate, microwave, burner, stove, or oven. So any two of those would create a kitchen. And what do they have, the kitchenettes? 
Um, I don't believe the plans specify what they have, but the plans do show specifically which units have full kitchens. And we have conditions of approval ensuring that the kitchenettes do not have this number of appliances. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe we should continue this. Yeah, I'm sorry. I usually don't want to interrupt, yeah. but it's mm -hmm. very specific to this yes. slide. <clears throat> yes. Okay. okay I'll, I'll go ahead and keep going then. Okay. So yes, maybe we can continue this discussion a little later. It's an important point, but thank you very much. We'll continue. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to move on and talk about um, some different resources, archaeological, historical, um, trees, biotic, and move this a little. No. Okay. So um, first, I'm going to talk about archaeological. So the site is mapped as sensitive for archaeological resources under the general plan. An archaeological review was completed for the project and determined that there is a very low probability of finding any archaeological resources on the site. Um, but we have included a standard condition of approval to stop work and contact the appropriate authorities if by chance a resource is discovered during um, construction work or excavation. Um, so in terms of historical resources, the site has, um, like I said, three buildings listed in the historic building survey, and I marked those with an H for historic on the slide. Um, and then there's two buildings proposed to be demolished. Those are marked with a D over on the left side here. The two buildings to be demolished are more than 50 years old. And because of this, they need approval of a non-residential demolition authorization permit. And this permit requires evaluation of the buildings to determine whether they have any historical significance. So the historic evaluation um, was completed for this project and that concluded that neither of the two buildings to be demolished is eligible for historic listing at the national, state, or local level. And demolition of these buildings does not constitute a historic impact under CEQA. Um, I'll also note that the Historic Preservation Commission um, found the development compatible with the historic nature of the three listed historic buildings on the site. Um, that's, that's outside of our review tonight. There are 11 heritage trees within the development area and their locations are shown in circles on this screen. The five green circles are trees that will remain with the project. The two yellow circles kind of in the center of the site are two queen palms and they will be removed and then relocated elsewhere on the site. The four red trees are an acacia tree, a plum tree, and two mulberry trees. Um, they are all determined to be in declining health and three of the four trees are also in the construction footprint. Uh, so these four trees are proposed for removal. The project arborist report included recommendations for removal as well as measures to protect the trees that are intended to remain. The city urban forester has reviewed this report and agrees with the report's recommendations, and those are included as conditions of approval. In addition, replacement trees are required for the trees to be removed um, at our standard ratio in the coastal zone, which is either two 24 inch box trees or six 15 inch trees for each tree to be removed. Okay, I'm going to talk about butterflies for a little bit here. It's a hot topic on this project um, and for a good reason. Okay, so under the general plan, a portion of the northern end of the site, as well as the really small sliver of the southern end, end of the property, are mapped as potentially containing sensitive monarch butterfly habitat. Under the local coastal program or LCP, the entire site is mapped as potentially sensitive. The monarch butterfly is identified as a special status wildlife species under the general plan, a sensitive species under the LCP. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has identified the butterfly as a candidate for the endangered species list. Um, but the species is not currently listed as threatened or endangered at the state or federal level. General Plan Policy NRC 2.4.1 and Table 1 of the Natural Resources and Conservation Element of the General Plan um, refer to general avoidance or management strategies to employ when monarch butterflies are present. These strategies include avoidance of butterflies, buffers, construction timing, or protection from indirect impacts. 
Um, similarly, the LCP um, policies EQ 4.5.3 and EQ 4.5.3.2 in the environmental quality element call for development in the vicinity of designated monarch sites to include environmental impact analysis and include management criteria to help preserve the nearby habitat. So these policies in the general plan and in the LCP provide our framework for assessing and managing the monarch butterfly resource when it comes to um, development. Okay. So this is a little snapshot from the biotic report. Um, the report prepared for the project found that the development area includes a um, mix of developed space, ornamental landscape area, and rural grassland. The report also identified the monarch roost grove that is off the site, but it's nearby at Lighthouse Field State Park. You can see it down here in orange. So I did some rough measurements, and the monarch butterfly habitat is about 65 feet from the southwestern corner of the property. There's a 20 foot length buffer along this south end. So um, when you add the 20 feet, the habitat is about 85 feet from the closest corner of asphalt in the parking lot. Um, it's also roughly 160 feet from the western edge of the proposed driveway along Pelton. And it's about 245 feet south of the southern end of the proposed building. The biotic evaluation included several visits to the site, including one in the fall of 2019 and several um, between October through December of 2021. These visits all coincided with the monarch roosting season. The evaluation did not find any monarch butterfly, butterfly excuse me, habitat within the development area. But the report did identify two areas with very limited potential for roosting on lot one, which is the proposed church lot or the lot with the church and the historic buildings. Um, so these two areas um, are the row of mature cypress trees that run along the south side of the church, and then a couple of mature cypress trees to the northeast of proposed lot two. Um, however, the evaluation did not see any monarchs roosting um, in those areas. I also want to note that the project does not propose to remove any of those trees. So the report made four recommendations that are consistent with the types of management strategies called for in the general plan and the LCP. Um, these are included as conditions of approval and I have them here on the screen. Um, so roost trees, including buffer trees, will be retained. Um, any occupied roosts will be buffered by 100 feet. Daily construction will begin after temperatures are above 55 degrees. Butterflies are cold blooded, so they can't really move around until the temperature gets above that level. And then trucks and equipment should enter and exit the site along Pelton Avenue um, from the east toward Westcliff Drive. So, um, so no, basically no right turns onto Pelton from the parking lot. Basically, you're coming in and out from Westcliff Drive um, and not going east or coming from east on Oh, not going west and coming from west on Pelton. Okay, so um, those are the four conditions that I had included originally. Um, we received actually quite um, a lot of really good feedback from the public um, that they had submitted for the September 1st hearing. And they had a lot of good suggestions um, for protecting the existing monarch butterfly habitat. Um, so the project biologist reviewed those suggestions and um, included quite a few recommendations um, that I would like to include as additional conditions of approval. So I have them listed here. Um, so prohibiting, so this is once a project is constructed to prohibit right turns out of the Pelton Avenue driveway. Um, and so that will stop headlights from sweeping across the monarch butterfly habitat at night. Requiring signage prohibiting high beams until drivers are completely on eastbound Pelton Avenue heading towards Westcliff Drive. All commercial deliveries shall use the Westcliff Driveway um, for entering and exit the site at all times. Final landscape plans shall locate new trees to avoid excess shading of nectar resources. All exterior project lighting 
shall be shielded to contain the light source in the downward direction and shielded from the monarch habitat. Provide an on-site water source, such as a fountain for the monarchs near the nectar garden. Install and maintain predator-proof waste bins. Eliminate populations of yellow jackets, eastern gray squirrels, and rats on the property using non-toxic methods. Restrict the use of seed feeders that attract eastern gray squirrels and corvids. Utilize leaf vacuums instead of blowers and prohibit the use of um, certain pesticides known to negatively impact monarchs. I'm not going to try to pronounce that. <laughs> okay, so um, so we did include quite a few conditions, um, and I just want to, once again, want to thank the public for really being very proactive in, in providing their suggestions on that. Oh, this skipped me way too far ahead. Okay, so I want to take a little bit of time now to talk about um, neighborhood compatibility um, in terms of, I already talked about visual a little bit, so I'm going to skip over that, but in terms of traffic and circulation, um, amenity and back of house uses and privacy, because those are topics that um, are important when you're thinking of the site layout for design permit and then also for a special use permit and compatibility with the area. So we have received a number of comments and concerns about traffic. Um, so our framework for evaluating traffic has two components. The first is based on the number of vehicle trips, and that's for consistency with our city regulations, which is managed by the Public Works Department. The second component is vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, for review under CEQA. So in terms of vehicle trips, the traffic study submitted for this project indicated that there are fewer trips than the previous school use. This study was reviewed and accepted by the Public Works Department. And since there are fewer vehicle trips than the previous use, the Public Works Department has no further requirements. And then in terms of VMT for CEQA, the project is exempt from VMT analysis per the city screening tool, which includes community care facilities as an exempted category. So there's no further review under CEQA for that. Um, in terms of um, circulation, the site has been designed to keep cars away from eucalyptus. You can see the entrances on Pelton. Um, there's also another entrance that could be used on West Cliff Drive for commercial vehicles. Um, and that really keeps the traffic away from eucalyptus Avenue and the other residential streets in the neighborhood. The left turn only condition of approval to protect the butterflies will also help to keep um, vehicles from traveling through the residential neighborhood. I'm including a condition of approval to remove a pedestrian pathway that's shown on the plans on um, kind of the southwestern part of the project that leads from eucalyptus across to the main entrance. Um, I have a condition of approval to remove that and that will help to discourage people from parking on Eucalyptus Avenue in order to utilize the facility. Um, one other note on parking, the applicant has indicated to me that the operator of this facility intends to hold some special events um, that would result in increased staffing and visitors on the site. We have a condition of approval that limits the number of staff, I believe, to 21 at any time. Um, so I'm proposing an additional condition of approval that will allow up to six events per year, but requires the applicant to record um, like a land use agreement, memorializing an offsite parking and transportation plan um, to show how they're going to deal with the additional um, cars coming to the site for those events. And then moving on to amenities and back of house uses, those are shown in orange on the picture here. Um, they're mostly placed away from the residential uses. Um, the laundry use is down in the basement, so that's away from everything. Um, and the deliveries are going to be on the southwest side of the building, which is about as far from the residences as you can get. In terms of privacy, um, there is a 
row of large trees planned along the northern property line, and that'll create a nice screen between the development and the single family homes to the north. There are also trees proposed um, along the north and the east sides um, of 112 Eucalyptus Avenue, which is a single family home just tucked into this uh, southwestern corner of um, right adjacent to the development. This is probably the most impacted residential property. I've included an additional condition of approval. Um, there's a, a second story unit right above this fitness use. So the second story has a unit and has a balcony coming off of it. And the balcony is fairly close to the residential property here at 112 Eucalyptus. So I have a condition of approval for um, some privacy screening to the balcony. Um, I have that condition in the um, conditions that were published last week. Um, however, the property owner and the applicant have a detailed condition. Um, and so I have um, submitted that. That's in the list of revised conditions. And so I'm proposing changing the condition to that more detailed that, that has been agreed upon. Okay, I'm almost at the end here. So in terms of CEQA, the project has been determined to be exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA pursuant to Public Resources Code Section 21083.3 and State CEQA Guidelines Section 15183. This exemption is for projects consistent with the general plan and zoning ordinance and where uniformly applied existing development policies or standards will substantially mitigate any environmental effect on the project. The project also qualifies for a categorical exemption pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15332, which is a class 32 exemption for infill development projects. Staff recommends that the planning commission acknowledge the CEQA determination and approve the project with the proposed conditions as well as the um, new and revised conditions that I've discussed um, I also have a couple other um, um, revised conditions on that memo that I sent out that should also be published on the website. Um, just a couple of minor things. One was um, just changing the word easement to land use agreement because they can't technically do an easement. They're retaining, the church is retaining ownership on both properties and they can't technically do an easement. So we're doing a land use agreement instead. Um, and there was a condition of approval for an easement for um, the additional parking spaces to be constructed on the adjacent property. I'm proposing to remove that because those parking spaces are not required in order to meet the parking requirement. Um, and I think I've discussed all the other proposed changes. Um, so that should conclude my presentation um, and I'm available to answer any questions. Great, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. And so we are now going to go to questions. And um, let me just ask the staff, I think, do we go to um, questions from or comments from the applicant first? And then do we go to questions from the commission? Mr. Marlot. It's, it's Chair's purview. Typically, um, the, the next step is commissioner questions of mm -hmm. staff, and then um, you go ahead and open the public hearing, and um, and the applicant typically um, has an opportunity to ask questions, and then you can ask questions of the applicant. And then, okay. and then the general public has the opportunity to speak, and then typically we allow um, applicant an opportunity to rebut any comments that were made, then you close the hearing and, and render a decision. Okay, great, thank you. So let me open this up for questions from the commission at this juncture. And I see uh, Commissioner Schiffrin. Uh, I think Commissioner Kennedy had his hand up first. Oh, I didn't see that on my screen. Sorry about that. Yep, there it is. Commissioner Kennedy first, and then Commissioner Schiffrin. Oh, thanks and no worries. Um, I have a question about that uh, PV trellis up on the roof. The I, I understand the recommendation is to eliminate that. Would that eliminate the roof deck as well, or just that element that sticks up? 
It just removes the element that sticks up. Um, they're allowed to have a roof deck that that doesn't affect the height limitation under the zone district. Okay. And um, I'll leave that there for now. One question about monarch butterflies. Is my memory right that I think those are really low monarch butterfly years anyway, right? We had a big dip and then the population came back somewhat miraculously last year. Did, was that factored in? Did that come up in those reports? I mean, the reports are very thorough, but I had that question. I believe it was, but I would rather leave it up to the biologists to explain that more thoroughly because I would probably do a terrible job. Understood. Uh, that's not your area of specialty. <laughs> um, and so in the discussion about the monarchs, did anyone talk about having this project just be like the best monarch habitat ever? Or is it kind of all in the context of like mitigation of damage? Uh, well, the project is is including um, a lot of nectaring plants in their landscaping. So they did go out of the way to um, try to provide that amenity for the butterflies. Um, I think there is some consideration for um, what types of habitat to include. Um, certain types of habitat are not good to uh, put next to a roosting site. And again, the biologist can probably explain this better than me, but um, I think I think they were pretty careful about including nectaring plants, which is good, but not like like milkweed mm -hmm. or, or something else that would actually be detrimental to the butterflies um, based, okay. based on their proximity to the roosting site. Thanks for summing that up. Um, and yeah, I agree the experts have studied it. Um, so two more quick questions. I like the left turn out of the driveway does that have hard infrastructure associated with it? Or is it kind of a signage thing at this point? Like, I don't know, it would be appropriate, but some sort of, you know, bulb out or uh, concrete thingy. Uh, the condition of approval doesn't have any like bulb out required. Um, I think mm -hmm. it's, it's more, I think it's more of a signage thing at this point or more open-ended, but that's, I mean, definitely something that you can. Okay. Uh, that just seemed like a good idea and it might be better in my opinion if it's uh, more solid than a sign um and then last question like i i uh i trust uh commissioner schiffer will go deeper into the affordable housing count it looked to me like only the memory care units do not have kitchens but that's just for me running through the plans um right now so that's not really a question but um We'll get into that more, I'm sure. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Commissioner Kennedy and uh, Commissioner Schiffen. Yes, just a couple of, a few questions, uh, not about inclusionary requirements at this point. Um, I did want to follow up on what Commissioner Kennedy said about the exit on to Pelton. And I wondered <clears throat> if there are any roadway improvements proposed from Westcliff to the driveway. I mean, that Pelton is in terrible shape and um, the traffic is going to increase going down that road. There are going to be trucks going down that road for the project. So I just wondered whether there, the Public Works Department had indicated whether uh, repaving uh, uh, Pelton from Westcliff to the driveway was uh, anticipated as a condition of approval or just to meet city standards. No, the Public Works Department did not include any um, improvement requirements. Um, I believe that is related to the fact that the traffic report came back showing fewer trips than the previous use, um, but they're not they're not requiring any new paving along Pelton. Okay, and I wonder also, especially since this is going to be a senior facility, uh, whether it would make sense to improve the sidewalks along Pelton. Um, as a as a, an amenity for the residents uh, and for public safety, uh, assuming that people may want to walk to Westcliff and enjoy the bay. So you know, I uh, assume that those are not conditions of, of approval. Um, I wonder if they would be considered legitimate conditions of approval to add. 
Um, that might be something the Public Works Department is requiring. I can look that up for you real quick. I'm logging on to look it up. Typically, the Public Works Department does require sidewalk improvements for um, projects large and small. Um, it might take me a minute to find that answer for you. Well, my next question is really, <clears throat> I see from the smiling face that Jim Moose might be here uh, as the city's environmental consultant. And my question, I have a couple of questions about the environmental, uh, the CEQA requirements. And one of them has to do with, since the, the LCP that is in effect in this area is from 1994, I'm wondering whether the LCP would require a, or trigger environmental review beyond an exemption that you know, might either a uh, negative declaration or an EIR. So I wonder what the thinking was in terms of the relationship between the uh, LCP and the CEQA determination. And this is, the, I'm sorry, this is your, this is based on the age of the LCP? Well, just in terms of, it's not, the LCP is different from the, from the general plan policies. And so I don't know whether, uh, and the fact that this is in sort of a, a special kind of, it's in the coastal zone, it's in a shoreline protection area. I just wonder whether those, the kind of LCP requirements, and particularly since there are what might be considered coastal resources in terms of sensitive habitats in the area, whether that would justify um, a higher level of secret review rather than just an exemption. And Commissioner Schifrin, so the public understands, could you say what LCP stands for? The Local Coastal Program, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think it would. I think, you know, the LCP has like sensitive habitat mapping, just like the, just like our general plan does. So we look at both when we have a project that's in the coastal zone. Um, both the general plan and the LCP call for site-specific biotic review um, for like, for example, monarch butterfly habitat. Um, and then if the biotic review finds that there might be a significant impact, then that would, um, you know, potentially kick us out of an exemption from CEQA, but that was not found in this case. So what you're saying is that the fact, uh, the policies of the LCP um, would not require a higher level of uh, environmental review than the current general plan or the project, you know, the, the project requirements. I don't believe so. Um, you know, if, if if Eric, Eric looks like Mavs wants to say, or Jim Moose wants to jump in. Go yeah, I'll, I'll also add that um, because the coastal zone typically includes um, more sensitive habitats, the policies that we have in both the local coastal uh, plan as well as the implementing ordinances, which are also in the zoning code, um, have uh, development standards that seek to uh, protect these habitats or sensitive areas. And it's these very standards that we're relying on and that, that CEQA section 21083 allows us to rely on as uniformly applied development standards in order to justify this uh, exemption that we're proposing. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Jim to see if he's got anything to add. Yeah, happy to address this. Since uh, my, my name was brought up uh, by Commissioner Schifrin, very happy to answer this. So there were two independent exemptions that were relied on here and both of them really are focused on the, the general plan and and not the lcp uh, these are these are uh, exemptions that apply throughout the state and most of the state doesn't have coastal plans and so the first one 2183.3 uh, applies where you have a project uh, consistent with a general plan for which an eir had been prepared and so we have a fairly recent general plan compared to the old LCP. And the project's consistent with the general plan. And under that exemption, the, the question becomes whether there are impacts that are peculiar to the parcel or to the project. And so in other words, impacts that uh, haven't been dealt with 
previously at, in a general plan EIR or impacts that, that can't be mitigated uh, by what are called uniformly applied development policies or standards. So there's, there's language in this statute that, that says if you have a uniformly applied development policies or standards that will substantially mitigate an impact, that impact is not peculiar to the, to the uh, project or to the parcel. So essentially there are two ways to conclude that something is not peculiar to the parcel or project. One, it's been dealt with in sufficient detail in the prior EIR, or secondly, you have policies or standards. And so here uh, it was concluded that between the general plan EIR and the analysis found there and the various uh, ordinances and, and other regulatory uh, requirements of the city, essentially all the impacts had been addressed and were not peculiar to the parcel or could be substantially mitigated. So that's the first exemption. And, and in that exemption, the LCP just didn't really enter into it, except to the extent that it might supply some of these policies or standards. And, and the age of the uh, LCP didn't enter into the discussion. It's simply not something that that statute identifies as an issue. The other exemption is the infill exemption. Uh, and these are for projects that are consistent with general plan and zoning and are five acres or smaller and meet certain criteria. And that they're fairly limited criteria. Uh, you able to serve something uh, with utilities and public services, substantially surrounded by urban uses, no habitat value for rare endangered or threatened species, uh, no significant traffic water quality and noise impacts, I think. So all those issues have, have been addressed. And again, for that second exemption, the LCP doesn't really enter into it. That exemption was upheld 20 years ago. It's essentially a, a way to encourage infill development by not requiring CEQA analysis. And we felt that this project came within the parameters of that exemption. In addition to the, uh, the first one, it was quite a bit more complicated. Okay, thank you. My final question has to do with it was I was to, from my experience, it's fairly unusual to get an initial study done for an exemption. Um, so I was wondering who prepared the what essentially was an initial study. I think it was really helpful to have the detailed environmental analysis that was provided. But normally that isn't the case with uh, exemption. Maybe it's going to become the uh, it's going to become normal as these kinds of exemptions are used. But uh, was it did a consultant prepare that initial study, or was it prepared by staff? Um, how uh, I assume the consultant paid. I mean, the applicant paid for it. But how? Who prepared the initial study? I don't remember there was any um, indication on the document itself as to who developed it. Yeah, our um, our CEQA consultant, Dudek, prepared it. It's technically, I don't believe it's an initial study, but it's very, very similar. It's, um, I mean, it kind of looks at the same thing. It's an expanded exemption checklist that just does a very detailed um, review um, to show how the project fits in with that particular exemption. I, I think it's advisable to do such a, a detailed analysis when you're when you're relying on this particular exemption under 2108 3.3 of CEQA, because it requires you to consider every impact. And it's it's possible that sometimes you'll find that some impacts are peculiar to the parcel. They're not mitigated. And you could have essentially a negative declaration focused on a handful of issues and have a bunch of other ones that excluded. So here they went through every item on the on the normal checklist to make sure nothing was missed. And so I think it's the reliance on that exemption that has brought about such a detailed analysis. And I guess that's where from the public correspondence where there are people who disagree whether there are significant impacts, let's say, on the monarchs. That, but I, I, I understand the process that was used and the rationale behind it. But this is helpful to me. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to give a quick answer to Commissioner Schifrin's question on the sidewalk. Um, I did pull up our public works review comments, and they have three requirements for the sidewalk. They're requiring an ADA corner ramp um, at the corner of Pelton and Eucalyptus. Um, they're requiring a new 10-foot wide sidewalk on Pelton from Westcliff to Eucalyptus Avenue. Oh, great. 
including street trees. And then they're also requiring repair of sidewalk, curb and gutter along the property frontage and replacing in kind per city standards. So those were not listed um, specifically as conditions of approval, but we do have a condition that all public works requirements must be met. So typically when we have department review comments, um, those aren't necessarily included in the list of conditions, but they do all get applied at the building permit stage. So it might well be that uh, since public work requirements have to be met, if the public works department decides, I mean, in a sense, legally, uh, what was there before doesn't matter because there's nothing there now. So this project is going to be uh, is going to be an increase over what the current use of the of the street, and given the condition of the street, I think it's worth really looking at uh, whether it is justified to and. Given that they're going to be construction vehicles going up and down Pelton, um, I think it might be worth taking another look at whether that would be a reasonable condition to have um, to have that section repaid. So thank you. Thanks for checking that out. Yes, thank you. Very helpful. All of those questions and answers. And now Commissioner Maxwell. Yeah, thank you. Um, I definitely a lot of the questions I had were asked, but I definitely want to um, acknowledge Commissioner Kennedy's um, request of, like more than signage, uh, if we're really going to be uh, honest about directing traffic um, off of Pelton and and really making it is, you know, I live live over there. It's pretty easy to go up Pelton either either direction from eucalyptus. Um, that said, I definitely want to acknowledge that, yes, we are on the lowest um, monarch population right now as we speak. Um, and I visit that grove uh, almost weekly, if not more than that. And um, it's, it's a sensitive area and we need to be aware of that. Um, I think that, you know, we can talk about EIRs and CEQA and all that, but really if you stand there and you realize that there's going to be a major construction project there we need to mitigate damages or offset anything that would be a negative impact to that especially right there it's literally across the street from that area uh, from that eucalyptus grove that's there um but my real question was um about the staff report when it comes to kitchenettes did it did it say uh, more than one and a half inch drain on a sink for kitchenettes? Or was it one and a half inch drains for kitchenettes? That's the minimum um, drain size for a kitchen sink. So the sink has a, a 14 by 14 dimension and then a minimum drain size of one and a half inches. If the sink drain or the dimensions are smaller than that, we don't consider it to be a kitchen sink. Right, yeah, I know as a, as a builder, uh, Bathroom sinks are also one and a half inch minimum as well. So that's why I was asking. Um, but that's all I have, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Maxwell and Commissioner Mercedes Miller. I just wanted to, uh, for the edification of the other planning commissioners, um, if you look at the project plans that are included in the agenda packet, Sheet C 1.1 references con proposed concrete paving and sheet C 6.0 calls out uh, city standard curb gutter and sidewalk from um, West Cliff to Euclidus along Pelton. So I think it's well, well covered. Um, as, as a, I'm not sure what um, Commissioner Kennedy might want to do about requiring some sort of hard left turn only constraint. Um, but I would caution uh, us from making some sort of um, condition without consulting with public works. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, create a hard uh, stop in a street um, to prevent um, you know, or to force a left turn only without impacting uh, traffic on Pelton. Um, so I, I just caution us from making a, a, a condition like that without checking with the public works. Thank you. Okay, thank you, 
uh, Commissioner Masini Miller. Um, I I guess I did have some questions. If there are no other questions um, regarding the kitchenette question, the issue, and um, and where in the plans it indicates kitchenettes is my first question. And secondly, just really curious about what a kitchenette is, what is contained in the kitchenette. So the plans um, identify um, which units have full kitchens, um, and that's on. Yeah, I saw that piece. Okay. The thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's where it shows. It has a little dot. Um, she, yes. Just so everyone else. She G O O one. Um, it, the plans don't define specifically what is in the kitchens versus what is in the kitchenettes. Um, that's why we've included the conditions of approval um, to um, specifically limit the kitchenettes so that they cannot rise to the level of being a kitchen. I see. So, okay. So uh, then I guess the question is what... It's hard to imagine what a kitchenette could be that didn't have at least two of those items and how it would even be a kitchenette. Like, how can you have a kitchenette that oh, doesn't include right. two of those items? For example, you could have a small fridge that is, um, like, I think it's uh, no larger than two and a half cubic feet, like a small under the sink fridge, and then you can have a microwave. So you can have I that, see. you can have like a little bar sink, but it doesn't rise to the, the size of a kitchen sink. Um, so mm. okay. that, that's kind of what would constitute a kitchenette. I see. Okay. Um, and, but it's nowhere in the plans what they had intended originally in terms of the kitchenettes. Correct. So um, I was just looking at those, the yeah. unit floor plans and kind of eyeballing them. Yeah, it would be. That useful. was what I did. And they, they draw like a little fridge and a little stove top or something. But I didn't found it like listed out anywhere. Yeah, I didn't see that either. Which is curious. Um, so that was Commissioner Kennedy's question. Commissioner uh, Schifrin. Yeah, to follow up, I want to ask why is the intention of the uh, condition of approval to prevent kitchenettes? Um, why not encourage them? Um, and that, from my point of view, that would mean there'd be more affordable units. Um, right. I think and that, more... you know, to, to sort of say you can't have them and with the only real purpose in doing that and keeping is, is to keep the number of affordable units limited. It doesn't necessarily make sense to, to do that. Uh, kitchenettes can be very, even... Uh, my mom lived in La Posada. She had a little kitchenette with a stove top and a refrigerator. I'm sure it would qualify as a kitchenette. It had at least two or three of those requirements. And, you know, she ate in the dining room most of the time, but she could cook in her unit. And since most of these are assisted living units and congregate care units, they're only 35 memory care units where I would imagine it wouldn't make sense to have a kitchenette. If those are the units, those uh, had little kitchenettes allowing uh, the residents to do minor meals for themselves, I would think there's no reason to, I don't understand, or I guess my question is, what is the reason for discouraging that rather than allowing it, but just require that if they do it, they need to provide more affordable units? Right, and that's actually exactly what we're doing. Um, so we're not restriction. We're not restricting um, kitchenettes. Um, we're we're saying that what we've approved here is a plan that has 13 full dwellings and therefore needs two affordable inclusionary units. What we don't want to see is down the road these kitchenettes turn into kitchens, but we're not recouping the number of. of affordable units that would go along with those additional, what would now be considered full dwelling units. So that's kind of why we oppose, uh, are imposing what looks like a limitation, but then if they want to expand and have more full dwelling units in the future, they can do that. They need a modification to the permit and then we would 
we would apply the inclusionary requirements to bring up the number of inclusionary units. But on the other hand, it seems like there are kitchenettes being proposed now in the plans. And to the extent that they meet the requirements of a kitchenette in the code, um, they should be, I, I would think we would want to approve them now rather than just limit it to the full kitchens uh, and then have them have you know, require them to come back if they want to have these other things, which we're never going to know about anyway, because, you know, nobody's going to go in. So I think this is the time to try to determine how many um, kitchenettes that meet the requirements of the ordinance uh, that would come in under a full dwelling unit uh, are being proposed and then developing the, um, you know, allowing them and, and determining what would be the inclusionary requirements based on that. So I, I just want to clarify that kitchenettes, um, that's kind of a term we're using. I don't believe it's actually defined in the zoning ordinance, but we're just kind of using that right now as something that is less that falls beneath the definition or the threshold of a kitchen. So we have units on the plans that are designated as having full kitchens. And then we have units that show some kitchen features on their floor plans, but they're not designated as the units with full kitchens. It's a unit. Well, that's why I interrupted you when you were giving your presentation, because the actual definition of a food prep of a kitchen includes a room or a portion of a room that allows for cooking and eating facilities. So, you know, that's where a kitchenette would be allowed. Um, yeah, but you wouldn't well, need it. It's a that, but it also needs to contain at least two of those fixtures or appliances within that definition. And so, You're right, absolutely. But that's the thing to ask the, the, the that the is something that doesn't do. contain those appliances and does not meet the threshold of a kitchen. Do we know that? Yeah, it's hard for us as a commission to evaluate that. We can't see the floor plan. We don't. We don't know. Right, and that's and it's why really I've significant. Condition, that's why I've included conditions of approval, stating that on their building permit plans, they need to show exactly what is in these units, and they need to show that the units that they're calling with full kitchens actually need to have full kitchens, and those that they're showing as only having kitchenettes need to have. A combination of, of appliances and fixtures that do not rise to the level of a full kitchen. So that's that's all defined in the the conditions of approval. So we know exactly that what we're approving is what is going to be built. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, um, but we've gone around and around. So let's move. On. <laughs> I think Commissioner Kennedy had a question. I'm sorry. I want to go around one more time. <laughs> so the memory care, like, there's no question, right? Look at plan sheet A110B, right? Memory care type B. You know, this is planning stage. This might be designed further. But my grandmother died a year ago, had a great life in a memory care facility, $12,000 a month. Why the hell do we not have affordable housing in those? Are you kidding me? I can't afford that. That's crazy. So um, I don't mean to be jokey about that, but why why don't we get an affordable unit out of those memory care units here? We're giving away this piece of coastal property. It's prime zone. We need housing. Can we just set the amount of affordable units now? Well, the, the number of affordable units is um, in our inclusionary ordinance. It's based on the number of dwelling units. And so we have to apply our definition of unit. a memory care unit does not rise to the definition of a dwelling unit. Um, so that's why we have, you know, this 76 units, but only a certain portion of them are considered a dwelling unit under our inclusionary ordinance. Okay. I mean, I get it. It, it doesn't seem fair. Yeah. I guess it's really hard to know. I mean, I think Commissioner Schifrin's point about how once it's built and we can't go in there. I mean, it, it's, I had a relative also who was living in a um, senior care facility who, you know, we brought additional appliances for um, when, when uh, she was living in this facility. And it's conceivable that people are going to want more 
more independence um, and they're going to, and, you know, even if you have a, a one additional small appliance, you would suddenly have a kitchenette according, or a kitchen according to this definition. So it's a kind of minimal definition that is enormously consequential for our community, um, unfortunately, because it's eliminating, I guess, 11 additional affordable units um, potentially or more, I don't know, depending on my calculations. Um, so meanwhile, it could so easily be skirted by someone simply bringing in another appliance. <laughs> so it's just kind of, um, unless I guess that could be deemed illegal to do because um, of these consequences. But um, so that's where we're kind sort of struggling with this definitional question. I don't know if um, uh, Mr. Marlott, you have a thought on that. I'll just, I'll just add that I I think staff felt the exact same way as Commissioner Kennedy did. Um, and, you know, this issue first came up um, early on when we were looking at the project. It was really in the context of a density bonus, which is a little different, but it does involve affordability. And so, um, you know, we were sitting down and evaluating that with our outside legal counsel that specializes in density bonus. Um, you know, it really came to light that we, we have some real serious limitations here given the way the, the code reads and the way that our, 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 our definitions are structured and that we really only can apply it to um, those, uh, I call them self-contained units that have the full kitchens. Um, so uh, I don't know that's a little anecdotal, but um, we, we did explore it with the outside council. We also reconfirmed it with the city attorney's office to make sure they were on the same page. They felt exactly the same way. So I think our, our hands are really tied um, and we're doing our best um, in terms of conditions and, um, you know, recording legal documents and that type of thing. Thanks, okay. Eric. That's helpful. Thank you. Commissioner Schifrin. I have another um, interpretation of this, but I think this is not the appropriate time to talk about it. I think we should hear from the applicant and hear from the public and okay. then have a more full discussion about this issue because I think there are other options that we haven't talked about yet. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so thanks, yeah, this has been a thorough com um, question period for the commission and we are now going to uh, turn it over to the applicant. No, to the public, sorry. Well, first open sorry. the public hearing and then- First the public, thank you. Open I the public sure hearing. The order right. And, and then, then we the will applicant. hear from the applicant. Yeah. So please, um, the public should feel free to uh, indicate that you're interested in speaking by uh, raising your hand. Uh, everyone has three minutes. But wait, um, I, I'm sorry, just a point of procedure. Yeah. Uh, legally, I think the first step is to say I'm opening up the public hearing. Okay. And then once you open the public hearing, the next thing is to hear from the applicant. After the applicant speaks and the commission has, if it has any questions, commissioners have any questions, then open it up to the rest of the public. I think that's the okay. That's what I thought. Procedure. Okay, good. So uh, yes. So instead, we will open the public hearing and first hear from the applicant. Thank you. Great. So I see a here. hand raised, and you should feel free to speak. Uh, that would be Roger Bernstein, correct? I have another Roger person. Roger Bernstein. Correct. Okay. It's, uh, on here at 6285593. Is that an applicant? Are you an applicant or are you a member of the public? I'm going to mute them because I know that Mr. Bernstein is with the applicant. I see Roger Bernstein in a separate box here. Okay. Can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, this is Roger and Shannon. Shannon's going to go first. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Clara, for a really detailed project overview. Um, good evening, members of the Planning Commission. I'm wondering if we should address this kitchen subject right away, or we can we have a um, overview of the whole project that we could do first, and then uh, wrap up with the kitchen discussion, perhaps. Um, so my name is Shannon Rusk, and I'm a senior vice president of senior living with Appenden and Roger Bernstein, who's head of our construction, is here as well. We are the applicant for the watermark of Santa Cruz senior living project. So, you know, we thank you for allowing us to come before you all. 
Uh, we feel like we've got a really well thought out project. Um, and um, before we get into the details, I think, uh, Claire, if you can put up the uh, team that we have assembled, I think it's page number two of our presentation, three maybe. So as you can see, we've got a very robust, oh, and she's screen Cherry. And we've got a presentation here. Go to page three, Clara. Yeah, thanks. We've assembled, you know, we've taken this very seriously. We have a really robust and qualified team. Um, and, you know, I, I, we feel, although there's a lot of issues, we've really thoughtfully assembled um, and contemplated all the meaningful and sensitive items for this really special location here in Santa Cruz. Um, as many of you know, we've been working on this project for nearly three years. And during this time, as Clara said, we've had two neighborhood meetings. We've weathered COVID. We all have, we all have weathered COVID, I guess. And uh, we've incorporated a lot of the input that we've received from community members. We've been very open to discussions. City staff has given us a lot of feedback and input and our consultants that we've uh, brought on board along the way have given us some really great uh, inputs and ideas. And you know, we're here today to you know, present this really well thought out project that will enhance the Lower West Side uh, in Lighthouse Field neighborhood in Santa Cruz. As we've, um, I'm gonna stay kind of high level and we'll bring it way down. As we've worked through the details and time has evolved, you know, one really apparent fact that we've learned is that there's definitely a need for this type of supportive housing for seniors in Santa Cruz. Um, we already have a long list of seniors that have reached out time and time again, wondering when this project is gonna be open for a move in and to be put on a wait list. So we're, we're pretty, we're very excited about this. And many are selecting and want this location so that their loved ones can visit them um, that might not otherwise be able to visit if we moved it, if it was a further out uh, non-convenient location. Um, there's a shortage in the Santa Cruz area for this type of housing with services. And the need is, we grow, the need is growing as we speak today. Uh, if you look at uh, statistics and demographics, which we follow daily, because this is the, you know, the business we're in, the number of seniors that's gonna need this type of housing is gonna double over the next decade. And that's backed and documented. Um, and there's simply just not enough supply uh, being built to accommodate this need. Um, the current environment of high construction costs is making it more difficult. Uh, land like this land is, is very prohibitive to build senior housing. Um, so to add to this, the number of adult children are what, you know, really more the caregivers for senior is decreasing over time. Just people are being more moved away from their families. And, and these types of inclusive, supportive, socialized events and communities are really important. And, and I don't wanna be an alarmist, but there really is a crisis looming and we need to be prepared to address this. Um, we've partnered with the best of operators to ensure that we are well positioned here in Santa Cruz to provide employees and caregivers is they have a large tool to pull, to pull, to pull from. Um, you know, that's really why we're in this business. It's taking care of the residents. Um, this community, I know there was some uh, misinformation on this, is going to be a rental community and does not require a large down payment. The membership fee is what we call our community. It's not a, it's not a big fee. It's in line with other communities in Santa Cruz. And it will be approximately between 12 and 14,000, depending on the, the apartment that each of the seniors select. Um, additionally, just for clarification, we're a residential community for the elderly, which is abbreviated, if you've heard these terms, RCFE. We're not a, and I don't wanna throw a lot of acronyms out, but a SNF or what's called a skilled nursing facility. So um, to put it in layman's term, we're, we're licensed by the Department of Social Services under an RCFE um, community. And we're skilled nursing facilities are licensed by the Department of Health entirely different um, uh, requirements. Under RCFE license, we have sig significantly reduced required staffing levels compared to a skilled nursing facility. And not because we don't wanna care for our residents appropriately, it's just we have different care levels that are required. Um, so we're you know always with water, we meet, we meet the care levels that are required by the RCFE licensing. Uh, and in most cases, we, we, we exceed those. So our, our monthly rent is, um, we do these studies, it's in line with other communities of our caliber in the Santa Cruz market. So, you know, we we feel very proud to be bringing the watermark of Santa Cruz to your community, you know, to allow for seniors that have lived here their entire life to remain in Santa Cruz uh, and to continue to enjoy the community that they love. 
and really most importantly to stay close to their loved ones in, in, in an aid location that they're familiar with. It's been, a, it's been a long road. You know, we've, we've tried to do everything possible to, to appease everyone. Um, and, and we really have, and I'm hoping staff can support that comment that I'm saying, you know, we hope that you can trust by our actions, our open communication and the revisions that we've made that we are committed. Um, you know, we're, we're here to ask for your support, bring this to the seniors of your community, um, uh, and to accept, you know, what we're, what we're presenting. It's a very much needed amenity. You know, I'm not from Santa Cruz. I'm from Minnesota, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, but if I've learned one thing over the last few years, I've learned that Santa Cruz is really a unique, unique community that is uh, really tight knit. And you know, I, I understand why seniors would want to stay here and live out their entire life. We're going to get into some of the um, particulars. We're not going to try not to overlap with all the things that uh, Clara has said. We'll um, I have a point of procedure. Um, how normally the applicant has 10 minutes. Um, how long are you? I see you have 32 slides up there. How We've long got another you, five minutes. Pardon me? Another five minutes. We'll stay within the 10 minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. You bet. Let's talk about the kitchens. Right yeah. Now. Right well, let me uh, let me just uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Roger Bernstein. I'm also with Offutt. Um, uh, unlike Shannon, I do live in Santa Cruz. Okay. I actually live on Pelton Avenue, uh, just down the road from this project. And uh, I'm also, uh, you know, very honored to be able to be here tonight and, uh, and present this project. Um, I know that, you know, Clara did a fantastic job um, presenting our project. And I was going to get into a lot of detail, but, you know, I think it's probably more important. Quite honestly, a lot of the neighbors know the details because I've met with a lot of the neighbors. Um, aside from the two neighborhood meetings we've had, I've had very, very, uh, I've had very many meetings uh, with some of the specific local neighbors, uh, including uh, Ralph Myberg, uh, who's been a huge support and help uh, with us, uh, helping guide us and, and helping keep the neighborhood informed of, uh, of uh, all the design changes and operational changes that we have made uh, to really work with the neighborhood. Let me, uh, let me just hit the, the, uh, the kitchen. Well, I think there's, there's, a, there's a misnomer here. We have 11 kitchens that we have proposed in this building. I know this talk of 13, two of them are actually in the inclusionary unit. So if you if you count them all, they're 13, but 11 of them um, would, we would consider kitchens in our AL units. We're not gonna have any more kitchens. We don't want to have kitchens because quite frankly, it's a, it's a, it's a safety issue with our, uh, with our members. When I call them members, they're the assisted living folks. They obviously in the memory care uh, there's 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 no kitchen or kitchenette or even what we would consider a wet bar, uh, but in the uh, in the AL units, um, we do not have uh, aside from the eleven units and those are mostly the two bedroom units that have uh, that have kitchens. Uh, the rest of them will have an under counter refrigerator, and perhaps we haven't made a full determination yet. Perhaps a twelve inch sink, and that's that's still up for grabs. We haven't made a final decision because we want our residents to be able to go to the dining room and, and, and eat in a, in a communal setting with the other residents. They like it, that's what that's part of the services we provide. We provide three meals a day, seven days a week, uh, plus you know additional snacks and functions and things like that. We want our residents to be able to commune with the other residents in the dining rooms. So we, you know, this is a full service uh, community where we take care of the residents' needs and that would, that would include eliminating the, uh, any need for any kitchens in these units. So just the 11 units uh, will have kitchens. We're not gonna have any more kitchens in these other units other than an undercounter refrigerator and as I said, perhaps a, perhaps a sink. And that's, a, that's an intentional uh, design directive and it's an operation to design an operational directive that, uh, that uh, our, uh, our operator watermark uh, goes by. So, um, and, and we, can, we can elaborate on that, but you know, I wanna try and keep it simple. Um, that's, uh, that's sort of, uh, a high level overview of the of the kitchen issue. Um, you know, I know we're we're short on time, and again, as I mentioned, uh, Clara did a did a really great job of uh, going through all the issues. So I think you know, in the interest of time, what I'd like to propose is that uh, we have our team here to answer questions if necessary, and uh, you know, we we sincerely hope that, uh, as Shannon mentioned, that you 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 see that we have made very significant. Uh, changes to our project to try to uh, 
uh, fit into this neighborhood. We're not trying to push this project forward. Uh, we're not trying to uh, force something in the square peg to a round hole. Um, I think Clara pointed out uh, very nicely that along eucalyptus, we create these building pods so that we are um, we are staying trying to stay within the scale of the neighborhood. Uh, we've uh, we've we've increased all of our setbacks around the building to uh, to provide some beautiful landscaping and hardscape, so that when uh, when residents look at our community, uh, they uh, they admire it, they appreciate it, and they feel that we are uh, we are enhancing the neighborhood. So I, I think with that, I'm, uh, um, I think that probably concludes our presentation, and I'm, I'd welcome questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, it's true that in the interest of time, I think I am going to request that we have members of the public speak for two minutes, uh, if at all possible. And there was one person who contacted us who wanted to speak for a bit longer. Um, is that member of the public here? Uh, I oh. believe so, yes. That was uh, Mr. Uh, Ralph Myberg contacted us in advance. Ralph Myberg, yes. So for Mr. Myberg, we can give Mr. Myberg uh, four minutes and we will ask that everyone who contacted us ahead of time speak for uh, two minutes uh, and if necessary, two and a half minutes, but we're going to try to keep it down because we have a lot of people here who want to speak. We want to make sure that everyone has a chance. Okay. So uh, maybe we'll start with Mr. Myberg. He had his hand up, but maybe. Okay. Boy, wait, no, we'll find him. There okay. he is. Thank, thank you, Mr. Myberg. You can start. I see your, your uh, microphone is off, Mr. Myberg. If you, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the commission uh, for hearing this matter. And so I was going to talk more lengthily about the process, but I'll just abbreviate that and say that we've worked successfully uh, from the neighborhood point of view with Roger Bernstein from Upper Den. Uh, he has been conflict adverse. He has listened carefully to neighbor neighborhood concerns regarding setbacks and various impacts. The project has been reduced significant, significantly. Um, of course, there are many neighbors that would like a park setting in this place rather than a development. But in, the, uh, in view of the fact that there was gonna be a development, we decided not to go the NIMBY YIMBY way, avoid that paradigm and see if we could um, in a very conducive way, reach results that were acceptable. Uh, Roger Bernstein from Upper Dan has been more than accessible. And as I mentioned before, uh, very willing to listen to neighborhood issues um, and try and accommodate them. I think in terms of uh, project height density um, and various other things involving with aesthetics, uh, it has been successfully resolved. Um, I would like to just break from what I initially prepared to mention something to, uh, that Commissioner Schifrin had brought up, and that was the improvement of Felton. Um, Andy, I think that would not be a good idea um, because we are trying to discourage traffic uh, on Felton because of the monarch butterfly habitat. And I think the significant improvement of the roadway will indicate to people that there's a road that is worthwhile traveling on, uh, especially if there's traffic on Westcliff. So I think um, we have a third world road, I grant, um, but it does operate uh, to slow traffic down. And as you know, there's a lot of recreational use on that uh, for coastal reference, uh, surfers and stuff. So you really can't have cars meeting very much. I think a better requirement and the one we've been pushing for is to have more traffic travel through the Oblets parking area, including trucks, especially during construction. Um, that solves a lot of the environmental impacts, especially the butterflies, but also 
Uh, we're talking about endangering people that are using that area pretty much as a parking area uh, for recreational use. Um, so from the beginning, and this was a major point, we have tried to persuade the Oblats to allow use of their parking area and entry exit onto Westcliff, uh, mirroring what was allowed under the gateway special use permit. Um, that further removes traffic from Kelton and away from the endangered. And I am gonna say endangered at this point. Right now, butterflies internationally are considered endangered. And there is a move led by Panetta that the US will soon accord that designation. It's serious. Um, I like what Commissioner Maxwell said about actually being on site. Uh, it goes through all the laws and regulations when you see exactly what's happening there. It's a very precious resource. Uh, butterflies are extremely meaningful for many reasons, and we should do our utmost to protect their habitat. Uh, so one other thing, I'm jumping a little because of time constraints, but I think uh, the lighting that exists, I know that Opperden are willing to go a long way to accommodate the environment, environmental impacts of lighting on that area. Um, but I think we should be more specific that uh, lighting should follow the guidelines Fine. of the dark skies and also that it should be ambient yellow lighting. Uh, so it has less glare to it. Uh, there's a possibility that lighting closer to the habitat should just be turned off at a certain hour. Um, so we're dealing with uh, ways of mitigating impacts that will have a deleterious effect on the habitat. This is a unique site and deserves as strong a protection as we can offer. Um, so in terms of... Access, and I think you're going to have to wrap up. I'm sorry, Mr. Myberg, in terms of okay. your... So let me, let me just then say that in terms of the, um, the actual parking area, the surface, uh, we think it should be permeable where functional and that it should be varied materials and colors. The design permit section 28 asks for colors which blend to surroundings. I think we should take that more serious. And um, outside of that, I would really appreciate that some um, direction be given that the outlets participate more in the impacts by allowing their parking, by allowing more parking access, especially at night when it's an underutilized uh, facility. Um, and once again, we're all uh, looking at a improved project vis-a-vis -vis the environmental, the very special environmental area defined under EQ9. One last thing is that in a previous coastal in a previous coastal commission hearing, um, the coastal commission um, closed off Kelton, as did the city council. So having a structure in the road, like a little um, outjutting planting area, just to signify to people coming out of the driveway that a right turn, the same width as a car, that would probably be very help, uh, helpful, uh, Commissioner Kennedy. Thank you, sorry for wasting time, but I spent two years on this as well. The impacts on the neighborhood for two years will be significant. Okay, thank you so much. We really appreciate your comments. Um, so uh, I think yes, um, and thank you for um, the staff for um, letting me know, the clerk for letting me know when time is up. Um, and uh, so good to have the public comment period begin. And we now are gonna ask for folks to try to keep it to two minutes if you can, given the number of people who would like to speak. So I see uh, that it is a number 628593, I'm not sure the name, um, who uh, would like to speak. Um, hopefully you can see your number and you can begin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good evening. Thank you so okay. much for having this. I am in the neighborhood and I am a former gateway parent. And I can tell you that um, driving from Eucalyptus and turning left on the alleyway and then turning onto Lighthouse Field, there was a sign that said left turn only and no one paid attention to it. So 
I would strongly recommend that we have something more significant other than signage saying turning left on Pelton because for the five years I was a gateway parent, no one paid attention to the turn left only on Lighthouse and turn everybody turned right. So that is never going to work. So as a neighbor, I really don't want all that traffic going into my neighborhood, turning right on Pelton. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, and next we have Ann Siegel. Am I, am I, um, hi, my name is Ann Siegel and I do live on Pelton Avenue. Are you able to hear me? I hope so, yes. Um, thank you. My first objection, I sent in a memo to you is that this should not be a Zoom call. It should be an in-person meeting that the crisis regarding the pandemic is no longer there. And I consider this inherent error, not to have actual people in your presence listening to our impassioned pleas regarding this pretty dramatic change. But in moving on, direct you to page 28 of the uh, layout, and that dumps the entire parking lot into Pelton Avenue. Uh, if you look at that illustration on page uh, 68, you will also see there is an opportunity to utilize the parking lots that are, are uh, through the obelates of St. Joseph. The obelates are the landlords. They are the landlords of this property and Watermark are the tenants. And as the landlords of this property, both parties are benefiting from a economically advantage, uh, advantageous, lucrative financial lease. The developer, the Watermark, is a national, highly financed, well-funded, equity-based, profit-making institution. Their compassionate plea that they're doing what they can for the people of Santa Cruz, maybe, maybe a result, but that's not their motivation. Their motivation is profit-making. Their motivation is development. And they are very, very strong and very powerful. The church is benefiting from this very lucrative long-term lease that has very little or no impact on their church facilities, church grounds, and their relatively unused parking lot that is adjacent on the southeast corner. And rather than trying to gerrymand and dump the parking into the lighthouse field, onto the monarchs, onto the horned owls, onto the coyotes, onto the pedestrians that use this gorgeous and beautiful feature of Santa Cruz City, have them go through, be direct as a condition of approval, have them go through the church parking lot and have that be reutilized as it was under gateway as it was intended by gateway as it was intended by the council they paved the parking lot allowed it for gateway egress and, and exit and on to Pel onto cliff and then on to bay keep it off of pelton let pelton remain pedestrian walkway that it is it's a beautiful pedestrian community I sit out here the other day on the traffic count. Yeah, they counted cars, but they never counted the number of walkers, surfers, people pushing baby carriages, children on bicycles, and other utilization of Pelton Avenue. Okay. Leave it. Let the monarchs live. Let's not mur murder our monarchs. Let this company and let these landlords work together to develop the correct egress and exits back onto Cliff back where it should be, back where there is commercial development. I'm taking you by your nods that I am probably over my time. Yeah. The, okay, so I'll stop. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, and yeah, so if, if folks can try to, I know we're, it's, it's, it's a strict, uh, it's a shorter time than usual, but it would be great if people could try to stick to that. But thank you very much for your comment. Um, so, could I ask that the yes. clerk be more assertive when the two minutes are up, please? Well, it's the chair's discretion. I mean, I have the ability yeah. to just stop I'll, the I'm going to start two keeping minutes, time on my but phone. I don't. <laughs> I'll try to. I'll try to. I'll try to be on top of it. Okay. So uh, we now have uh, Kathy. Please. Thank Hi, you. Hi. Thank. Can you hear me? We Thanks. can hear you. Great. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks for taking my call. I want to thank you for being so thorough on this project and really looking at all aspects and being so positive and open to everything. Um, my grandkids are fifth generation born in the neighborhood, the West Side neighborhood over there. And we have seen so many changes in Santa Cruz over the five generations. And we are so excited about this project. And yeah, there's more cars. Yeah, there's more people. But um, 
that's just what happens when you live in a tourist town. There are more people, there are more cars and we're excited. My, my mom, I couldn't, um, I didn't have time to go her, hook her up on the computer to, so she could be a part of this because she's not computer savvy, but she, her generation, her friends are excited about this project also because we do need more, um, when you do more senior housing and they're excited to be able to live in an area in a neighborhood like um, the project that you guys are considering and that the Oblates and um, the other company, I can't think of the name, is um, what they're projecting to build. So I'm really excited. I know there's a large group of people that are excited about this project too and want to thank you very much for your time and, and putting in all the energy you're putting in to look at every aspect. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Kathy. And uh, next we have Noelle. Hello, um, I have two questions. Um, I live on Manor right behind um, this project. And I'm concerned about two things. One being uh, the sewer. What, which sewer line are they intending to hook up to and will they be making any uh, improvements and then my second question is regarding dust containment during the construction um, is there anything uh, planned to try to I don't know moisten down the earth something to kind of keep the dust contained during construction and that is all Okay, thank you, Noelle, and for those questions. And I think we will um, try to recall those. Maybe the clerk can help us to remember those questions and we can ask the applicants after the public comment period to respond to those. Thank you. Um, and after Noelle, we have uh, Bill Henry. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Thanks for hearing me. Um, my name is Bill Henry. I'm director of Groundswell Ecology, and we've been working with the Monarchs for um, since 2015, um, working specifically with the Lighthouse Field um, population and California State Parks. And we also wrote the um, management plan and a recent update to that management plan. I'd say overall, I think this type of project is in alignment with um, what that place can handle and I also should say that I'm a, a gateway parent. My wife teaches there. My students went there when the school was there and access off of Westcliff Drive was fitting for the traffic and for the character of the area and also for the Monarchs. Um, traffic on Pelton Avenue is disruptive to the Monarchs and results in mor mortalities, which under the ESA, if they're um, listed, will be considered take. So that's kind of not a really good idea to set up, especially during wet weather when monarchs are blown off and land on the roads and then they get run over and killed. Um, so that could um, be complicating in the future. Um, so locating primary access on Westcliff Drive is probably a good idea at this time. Another issue is the shallow water aquifer um, needs replenishment. And so the more penetration permeable surfaces that we can give in the project is gonna really benefit that grove, which is drought stressed and will continue to be drought stressed under uh, drying um, conditions, which are forecasted with climate change. Um, obviously the nectar resources are important for late winter and fall. That's something that it seems like the applicants are working on and um, plan to do a lot for. Um, monarchs are susceptible to predation during the overwintering season. So having wise trash use is gonna be very important. Um, and managing the property that restricts um, the uh, proliferation of predators on monarchs like yellow jackets. Um, tree canopy will be important. So thinking about how we can plant Hi. trees and I know they've given some consideration to this. Um, just quickly, two other things or three other things are noise is gonna be very important. So reducing loud um, activities, uh, dust can negatively impact. So being mindful of that. Monarchs are sensitive to pesticides. So really be um, aware and have an IPM program that doesn't use pesticides. And then the last is nighttime light pollution can impact monarchs and it would be wise to have a lighting plan that doesn't shed light towards the grove. So thank you for your time, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Okay, um, and next we have um, Father Matthew and I'm not seeing the final name, oh, Spencer. Uh, Father Matthew Spencer, please, thank you. 
Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I represent the Oblates of St. Joseph and, and the landlord, and I did submit written comments, so I will uh, not repeat myself. Just wanted to um, address some of the concerns that I heard. Um, I'm very proud of what Oppidan has put together. Uh, I'm very proud also of, of the community involvement. Um, so many neighbors who have um, just very intelligently and peacefully engaged. It's been, it's been really neat to see. Um, I'm very pleased that the traffic, traffic impact of this will, will be much lower than pretty much any other development that, that we considered and looked at. And unfortunately, there's, <laughs> there's nothing that, that will completely eliminate traffic, but this was the best project that, uh, that, we, that, we, that we found. Um, I know that um, people look at our parking lot and see a lot of room, but if you come by when we have services um, at 11 every day, you'll see the parking lot is full. And um, this is a, it's a blessing for us. Um, it helps our coffee shop residents and, and that's, that's great too. But um, just so you know, I think the, the parking lot there is, is well utilized and, and is part of the consideration that we have. Uh, finally, I just wanna say, you know, um, we have a lot of our members of our shrine community who are interested in this, but every week at our coffee shop, I have people coming up to me, locals who ask when the project is opening, who, who tell me they wanna get on the waiting list, who are, who are so interested. They're not Catholic, they're not affiliated with our shrine. They just need, are gonna need housing in the coming 10, 15 years. So. I'm very pleased that we're we're going to be able to provide housing to to locals to our to our neighbors and that's a, a real blessing so and that's all I wanted to say thank you so much for this opportunity and, and thank you to the commissioners for your your service great thank you very much father Spencer and next we have Russ Weiss please thank you hi um can you hear me um, yes. Great. Um, thanks. So, yeah, I'm a, a former Gateway parent <clears throat> and a neighbor. Um, I submitted a letter on August 31st. Um, hopefully that um, you were able to read and <clears throat> I'm not going to um, replay that letter. It talked about con my concerns on traffic the size and scale of a development and a, <clears throat> on monarch habitat. Um, but I do have a couple of questions, um, which I'd like to ask. So I heard um, that I <clears throat> heard it described as infill development, but I don't understand that. To me, it's a commercial facility. Um, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's a profit, uh, it's for profit. And so I, it seemed like the infill development um, <clears throat> designation went along with not um, doing more environmental analysis or um, an EIR requirement. So <clears throat> again, I, to me, it's a new commercial facility. Um, and it, <clears throat> my second question is, um, I, I think it's a valuable, um, <clears throat> you know, it's valuable but I, I, I think it needs to be scaled back. And I'd like to ask if the commission could require that it be scaled back. I'd like to see it at 30 to 40 units. I think it would be much more appropriate to the site there and the traffic. Um, I'd also, I mean, I understand a number of uh, monarch um, habitat um, uh, <clears throat> things have been looked at, but I'd like to really see uh, an enhanced a habitat enhancement program. Time. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes, Mr. Weiss, if you could wrap up. Okay, that was it. Um, so after Russ Weiss, we have Jesse Bristow. Thank you. Uh, good evening, can you hear me? Uh, thanks. Um, my name is Jesse Bristow with Swanson Builders. Uh, thank you for taking my comment. I just wanted to speak in uh, support of this project. You know, I think we we often talk about at council meetings and planning commission meetings um, the need for more diverse housing. And I know that this isn't technically 
housing, you know, there's, there, it's a specialty service. It's, it's needed for this certain age group because that's what happens with life. And, um, but regardless, it's a growing need. And I think, um, you know, we don't have a facility like this in the city of Santa Cruz. And so, um, oh, you know, and, and I think it's a great and effective uh, reuse of the site. And over the past, you know, two, three years, I think the project has really evolved to try to mitigate um, a lot of the concerns and impacts that the neighborhood has shared with, with the developer. And um, it, I think it's just a great opportunity um, for, for a place for seniors to, to grow older. And, um, and I, I know there's a comment or there's a lot of concerns regarding traffic, but I believe nationwide, uh, the average age of these facilities is, I want to say, 81 or 83 years old. So not a lot of them do drive. And I do know there's other factors such as employees and services and things like that. But uh, I, I think it's a great reuse of the site. And if you've ever visited uh, assisted living senior care facility, they're very, very tranquil. And um, it's really a great place for older population to be. So um, I would encourage that or ask that uh, Planning Commission uh, supports the project. So thank you. Thank you very much. And after um, Jesse Bristow, we have Janine Sacco. Thank you. Oh, hold on one second. I skipped her on accident. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. We're ready for you, Janine Sacco. Thank you. Oh, Janine Sacco. And I'm already there as a senior citizen looking very, very hard to find a resident facility as time goes on. We're an 82-year-old couple that moved here, built our house close to the shrine to be part of their campus in that community and to benefit from the fresh air and just the dynamics of living in that, that area and to be able to stay in Santa Cruz as we age further. And many of my peers are online and waiting in line to have this project go forward. So thank you for considering it and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Um, and next we have, uh, and my screen is a little too small, but I think it's Bill and and I'm not seeing the full name there. You got it. It's Bill and Charlene. There we go. Bill and Charlene Barnes. Thank okay. You. So thank you for your time. Um, first, I want to remind everyone, we, we really are talking about an iconic piece of property here. You'll all recall the Lighthouse Field was saved from development. You'll also recall that uh, Wilder Ranch was saved from development. I think this is an appropriate development but it is also a for-profit development. So I do want to follow up on the concept that affordability is really important here to our community. And I have checked what this company does charge and their other properties. People who are leasing, renting, or buying into this unit will be looking out at an undescribable view. It's one of the iconic places in the world so what they can charge, what they will charge, we need to take that into consideration in terms of what we ask them to do for the community in return. So points, left-hand turn sign, inadequate. We need something more. I have grandkids at Gateway for years. Folks come out of Avenue A, they see the sign, no left turn, they make a left turn. Uh, lighting, it should be dark sky lighting, not just shaded lighting. We need to have standards. There are standards for some of the developments going up in town. So this is another important element. Um, and more forcibility of that. And I guess those are my two major points. I won't take up any more time except to say the concept of the initial study being done by a con or planning and being done by a consultant and what I heard was they check the boxes. When I go through checking the boxes, I don't come up with the same conclusion as to the impacts. But we don't have a counterbalance to having the staff hire a consultant to check the boxes to determine what is an initial study report that's adequate to achieve either a negative declaration or going to a full EIR. And it's consistent with the general plan 
only if you look at what the general plan says as far as cumulative impacts. Sorry, I think your time is up. Yeah, thanks much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and next we have Dennis Reagan. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to make another point about the egress and entrance on Pelton. It makes no sense to have that as the entry point when there is already the entrance on two sides of West Cliff. I'm very concerned about the dust and the other uh, mitigation that can be done uh, if the project continues. And I believe I also uh, want to reiterate what Russell Weiss was saying with regard to its size. I think it can be scaled back. And if it needs to be scaled back to eliminate that egress and entrance on Pelton, then I believe that's what needs to happen. And I think my time is up. I appreciate the ability to share. And one last comment, these COVID restrictions are not necessary and we should be doing this in a normal planning commission facility with the public, not on Zoom, on premise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and next we have Franny Bradley. Thank you. Hello, um, my name's Fran Bradley and I live over on Bay Street in the neighborhood. I walk on West Cliff all the time. I think this is a wonderful project. I'm a senior myself and I know that it's very difficult to have uh, affordable housing here uh, um, and assisted living. My mother lived in an assisted living for a while and it was the best thing that ever happened to her. And I'm just really, uh, I really think it's an exciting project to do. Thank you for all your help. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and next week we have some numbers coming up. The next number I see is one eight three one two seven eight zero four nine two. They have not indicated that they wish to speak with by raising their hands. So there's oh, a ton I of see. people that are listening that aren't necessarily wanting to speak, but this would be a good time for last call. Yes, thank you. Are there others who would like to speak on this issue? Um, and I see some hands going up. So we have first Sarah Sunrise. Thank you. And uh, Sarah, I think that your microphone is off. You're muted. So I'm not sure that um, this person can hear me. Uh, so for right now, oh, okay, I see the, hello, Sarah Sunrise. Hello? Maybe there's a technical. Everything's problem. fine. Speaker, you're on the line. Okay, we can go to the next one and come back to Okay, here. hopefully we'll come back to Sarah Sunrise. Next we have Lisa Glick. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for the conversation and all of the input. I just want to identify that I've been a resident on Lighthouse Avenue for over 36 years. And one of the things that I've noticed over time, and I feel very privileged to have landed here when I did, um, because as we all know, the community has changed profoundly. And the traffic patterns over the last decade or so have really increased. Parking on Lighthouse, parking on Pelton, parking on West Cliff, the lots on West Cliff being closed at various times and so on have really created uh, an increase in parking of people from out of the area, which I welcome people. We are a tourist community. I think it's great, but we have trouble parking in our own neighborhood um, and having our own guests park in the area. So I'm very concerned about the increase um, and the impact on the activity in the area in general. Secondly, I'm really curious about the down payment of twelve dollars to 
and the actual monthly cost of who are we serving and who are the residents in our community, the seniors that are gonna be able to afford living there at this very exclusive um, facility. And what about the elders that can't afford both that initial down payment as well as what the undisclosed monthly expenses are gonna be, which I really appreciate more information on that. Um, and I've also had resident uh, relatives living at other assisted living facilities in the area over the years, as well as recently looked at one. And it seems like there's really adequate assisted living in our area. And I wouldn't mind some more details backing up this need of, uh, I think the statistic that it was going to double over the next decade for residents. And even if it is, who are those people that are gonna be able to access these 76 minus three affordable or 2.6 affordable living units? Time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And uh, after Lisa Glick, we have Sarah Sunrise and hopefully um, Sarah, you're able to join us. And I see that your mic is off. Uh, and do you wanna to try to unmute yourself there? Let's see, maybe that's not gonna work. Okay, um, why don't you try that one more time and then, but we're gonna, right now we're gonna to go to Brian Schachter. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, great. Yeah, uh, this is Brian Schachter. I'm the Chief Investment Officer for Watermark Retirement Communities, the operator for the proposed project. I just wanted to address a couple of the questions that came up uh, on the, the prior person uh, in regards to, you know, who are the residents, who can afford this, et cetera. It basically, the way in which most people afford to live in a retirement community is through a combination of their uh, retirement savings and or the sale proceeds of their home and or the um, support of adult children. So usually it comes through a few different avenues. Um, in terms of the monthly fees that we're intending to charge, those haven't been finalized, but and it's really based off of market competitors. So while there isn't a competitor in the immediate area, there are uh, existing retirement communities, you know, in a five to 10 mile radius. And, and really our estimates thus far are based on comparing to existing competitors and, and ensuring that, you know, our rates are not out of bounds with what is already being charged in the broader market. So hope, hopefully that generally addresses the question uh, for the most part, people living in a retirement community are going to be um, either moving from within a five to 10 mile radius themselves or going to be moving into a community that's within a similar radius close to their adult child. So, you know, it's really about staying close to home, staying close to their services and, and doctor's offices, et cetera, and or being close to their family members. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Brian Schechter. And uh, I don't see any other hands up right now. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak? Yes, I see a couple now. Um, Jani Med Medved, would you like to speak? And um, can, this is the clerk. Can I just request that the members of the public all raise their hands? Because uh, we've got 49 people on the line. Not all of them have their hands raised, and we'd like to have everybody have an opportunity to speak. It kind of draws it out when people are coy about it. Okay, yeah, I see some people have already spoken who are on that list, but maybe there, if there are any people who have not yet spoken and wish to speak, um, you can put your hand up now, and we'll know how many more we have. That would be Hi, th This is Sean Medved under Janae Medved. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Um, I wanted to just. Um, help with the with the solutions to re reiterating what some other people have said about this um you know turn sign on coming out uh, onto pelton that i think everybody's starting to agree is not going to work there's a simple solution 
It's that the oblates take more of the impact and have the traffic come in and out of their existing parking lots and their two existing entrances um, to keep it away from the habitat and the neighborhood. The second thing is all that parking that's, uh, we live right next door. I mean, the parking lot is, sorry, Father Matthew, it's empty all the time. There's a, there's a few times when it's full. It's very rare. There's plenty of parking there. And as they look to expand that parking lot all the way over adjacent to the neighbors and adjacent to the habitat as per the plans, they're creating a giant asphalt field that's going to create a lot of heat, um, a lot of runoff that goes, you know, in towards the lighthouse field and the wetland or the, the wetlands and habitat that's so close. So there's a simple solution is that the oblates need to take some of the impact, have the traffic come in and out of there, share some of their parking. And the last thing is that the parking lot that the Oppidan does need to build should be porous and it should be earthen so that the water and can go through the ground and filter before it goes into the ocean, which is so very close. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next we have uh, Barry Michelle. You can speak. Hi. Hi. Thank you. And thank you for your service. Oh my God, your patience. So um, I live on Pelton at 140. I'm the only house, kind of. I'm right next to Sean, who just spoke. So I don't want to take a long time. I'm across the street from Dennis. I agree we shouldn't have the parking, I mean, the parking lot driveway come in off of Pelton. And I, I would love to not have all the lights and all the noise coming in on Pelton. And I don't know how I would get home if I couldn't turn right. So... <laughs> or maybe that's just out of the parking. I agree with Dennis and Sean and that we shouldn't put the driveway on Pelton. And if it could be smaller, great. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, next we have a number, which is 183-142-72174. Hopefully you know who you are and you can speak. Thank you. Am I next? Yes. yes. Yes? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Just saying this is very confused because you don't give anything on the television about how to call in. And there's no Zoom link on your agenda. Anyway, I don't want to take up my very limited time. Gillian Green's site. And I want to thank staff for the presentation. It was very helpful. And also to the developer who has responded to many of the concerns of, the, um, of everybody. However, um, I would question, I think you should question and maybe continue this item until you have answers about this being an infill project and therefore exempt from CEQA. This is not an infill project by any stretch of the imagination. And as an example of why CEQA needs to be looked at, uh, at least with a negative declaration, is the discussion around the monarch butterflies. Um, staff, with all due respect, called it twice a roosting site. It's not a roosting site, it's an overwintering site. There was mention of the fountain for the monarchs. Monarchs cannot drink out of a fountain. Um, and uh, the comment that this was a terrible year. Actually, this past year was better than the year before, none of which are very good. So I would say uh, you really need to study the environmental impacts on this very unique site much more carefully. I'm totally in support of everybody who wants the, traffic, the driveway not on Pelton. Those lights will impact mostly the traffic now is at night. With Gateway, it was in the daytime. That needs to be studied. Probably my time is running out, and there's one thing I really want you to study. The local coastal program, the one that is in effect now is the old one. It has not been updated. And in the LCP, it states that it wants to shorten MAP EQ9, but that has not time. yet been implemented. MAP EQ9 stretches not only Lighthouse Field, which is what the change wants to be, but spreads throughout the whole area of the Lower West Side. You need okay. to study that to make sure 
Patrick Jewett following the proper documents. I'm very sorry there's so little time. I hope you will continue this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, a lot of important points raised. And uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to speak and could raise your hands? Okay. Um, well, seeing none, um, I'm going to um, see if uh, the planning staff uh, and developer would like to briefly respond to any questions that were raised. Um, and I don't know if the clerk was able to note some of those questions. I think we can try to recall um, a couple of them. I'm just going to ask if the clerk I wrote did down. Not. I think staff was tracking that. I was running the meeting. Okay. Oh, so perhaps um, if um, staff, meaning uh, Mr. Marlott, was was writing down any of the questions. Um, I, w I was writing down a few of the questions, and I can. Clara respond. Spanger was writing down the questions. Thank you, Clara. So yeah. um, great. If so you want, if one of them had to do with a couple of people asked about infill. Maybe we can start with that question about why this development would constitute infill, and then other okay. questions. So, well. Generally, an infill exemption is um, suitable for a project that is um, substantially surrounded by existing urban uses. So in this case, we have we have development on three sides of the project. Um, there are some other criteria that that need to be met to qualify for that exemption. Uh, but the general idea it doesn't really matter if it's a commercial project or a residential project. It, it's um, the main thing is that it's substantially surrounded. So it's like you're just, everything's developed. You're just filling in the hole in the middle. I see. Okay. Um, and, and I'm sorry, go ahead. If you want in more detail, I'm sure our C book. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think our, that's um, good. Our attorney. Can, if, if people have um, yeah. you know, more questions, uh, yes. And I think there were, maybe there's more to be said about that question. I think there are also questions about the process of the development itself. But um, maybe, uh, Mr. Marlott, do you have anything to say about the infill point? I'll just add to that that the, um, the staff report does go into detail on how this project meets the infill uh, criteria that's outlined in CEQA. And that's on, um, it's the bulleted list on the bottom of page eight and the top of page nine. Um, you know, it's basically, uh, it needs to be consistent with the general plan um less than five acres in size um no value for endangered rare or threatened species um and no significant impacts to uh, vehicle miles traveled um and then access to utilities and public services and i think Clara's presentation went into some of those um details there okay thank you um and um planner sanger if you want to say any of the other questions that you got down? Sure. Um, so we had a question um, from Noel about where the sewer line will be located. Um, I looked on the plans and the sewer lateral is showing to connect to the sewer line that is on Pelton Avenue. Um, and then in terms of dust during construction, there's a few comments or questions about that. Our building ordinance, um, specifically section 18, dot four five dot one one five requires dust control during grading and excavation. Um, so that is something that is regulated. Um, there was my other highlight. Um, Jillian Greensight had a comment about the LCP and map EQ9. I think she might've been referring to the, the Monarch butterfly mapping. And she is correct that the Monarch butterfly mapping in EQ9 um, covers a much greater area than it does under the current general plan mapping. Um, I looked at both of those maps when evaluating the project. The EQ9 map does actually cover the entire project site, um, but both the LCP and the general plan call for site-specific review to determine the exact location of the Monarch butterfly habitat and to make recommendations. 
Um, the last thing I want to discuss really quickly, um, because we had several comments about access off of um, Westcliff versus Pelton. Um, let's see, I wanted to share my screen real quick, just so I can illustrate this. There are some issues with um, that that um, we did explore. Um, but one is that um, our fire code requires um, a maximum fire access distance of 150 feet um, from, from the Westcliff Drive entrance. The distance um, to where basically that fire access line is, is about 440 feet. So that's much greater than 150 feet. Um, there are a lot more design requirements that come in like fire truck turnarounds etc so if you had an entrance to only on westcliff you'd have to really substantially redesign the project um, even then the fire department indicated that they are not supportive of having to come through westcliff every time um, they have a call on this property um, the public works department also needs both a pelton avenue entrance and a westcliff drive entrance um, to do their trash pickup um, the trash enclosure is down at the south eastern corner of the parking lot. So they're either going to be um, entering from Pelton, going past the trash enclosure and exiting on Westcliff or vice versa. Um, and then a couple of other things. Um, our subdivision ordinance has a couple of sections that actually require new lots to have direct access to a street. Um, so we can't create a new lot, this new lot two where the development will be and say there's no street access. They have to have access either from Pelton or from Eucalyptus. Um, this project was designed to close off any access from Eucalyptus in order to be compatible with the neighborhood. Um, oh, and that's, um, oh, this is just to address um, a comment from Ralph Myberg, who, um, he said that there was a previous decision to not allow a driveway off of Pelton Avenue, and that's somewhat correct. Um, but it was not in, it was not imposed because of any uh, biotic or traffic um, reasons. It was something where the Oblates um, Church had decided to expand their parking lot, and then um, they basically. Um, redesign their expansion to make it smaller and remove the driveway. And that was just memorialized as a condition of approval. So it was nothing to do with um, like butterfly impacts or anything like that. Um, so there's nothing that would prohibit a development today from accessing the property off of Pelton Avenue. Um, and that's, those are the items that I had highlighted as questions. Um, if you see any more, you can let me know and I can try and address them. Um, back on the butterfly issue, I'll just add that I believe um, the applicant's biologist is here tonight. So if any of the commissioners have any detailed questions regarding the butterfly analysis, I'd encourage you to ask him. Thanks. Great. That's really helpful. Um, okay. So um, I think that does it for the um, public hearing portion then of the of the meeting and I would like to bring it back now to the commission for discussion and action. So commissioners, what are our thoughts? Um, I see uh, Commissioner Masidi Miller and followed by Commissioner Kennedy first. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Greenberg. I'm a uh, quite pleased with this project overall. I think the staff and the applicant have done a really great job working with the neighbors and doing their best to mitigate whatever impacts might a project of this type might have. I appreciate that the project's been scaled back. I hate to see less units in a project than more units in a project, but I appreciate the desire to incorporate the uh, project into an, in a, into an existing neighborhood. Um, I'm supportive of the project. I'm prepared to make a motion to approve this project. I would like to um, offer one uh, condition uh, to help manage the right turns out of the facility onto Pelton. And I would I would say um, something like 
to the extent permitted by the Department of Public Works and the fire department, a more substantial traffic control device shall be installed to prevent vehicles from making a right turn when exiting the facility onto Pelton Avenue. Um, I think that with the other uh, findings and conditions of approval uh, already offered by staff, including the revised conditions and the new condition that was included in the memo that was issued earlier today, um, I'm prepared to make, make a motion to approve the project. I also wanted to uh, point out that um, every project has concerns about traffic and everybody in Santa Cruz is concerned about traffic. Uh, but I think it's important to uh, take a look at the traffic report uh, done by the uh, Keith Higgins, a traffic engineer. And, you know, Keith was, um, uh, points out that the previous project had 769 trip ends or, you know, uh, traffic movements every day. And this project anticipated to have about 258. And so the the previous use of this site, you know, three times more intense than the current use. So really, we're looking at a substantial reduction in traffic um, when this project's completed. Okay. That's all I had to say. Thank you. And um, thank you for all of your thoughts there. And I'm thinking that perhaps we, um, it would be perhaps good to have more discussion before making a motion. So I appreciate that you're prepared to make a motion. Maybe we can have more discussion as well. Um, Commissioner Kennedy. So uh, I feel really good about this project. When I hear the neighbors and the developer all work together to solve so many things, I just think that's wonderful. That makes my job easy, and um, I appreciate that. So I had one. And one more item I wanted to bring up, and that is that uh, trellis up on the roof deck. I'm not sure if everyone looked at this. Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is I think we really need to start utilizing the roof space on our buildings a lot more than we do right now for all sorts of purposes, stormwater, obviously generating electricity, all sorts of stuff. This project was three stories. It's now two stories. And I just wanted to talk with other commissioners about whether that trellis specifically above the roof deck needs to go. So if you take a look through the plans, I could lead people through, but I'll let you flick through on your own. Um, it seems to me like it's really far from the neighbors. It seems like it'd be a great spot to sit at the senior and look out over everything. So uh, Clara, do you want to tell me a little bit more about that and how that decision was come to? Because it, it does seem like a really awesome feature to me. Sure. So, um, so you're right that the project did start out as a three-story building. Um, the West Cliff Drive Overlay Zone District allows a maximum of two stories. Um, so the three-story building would have required some kind of an exception to that in the form of like a density bonus or a planned development permit or something like that. Um, the applicant ultimately decided to not go that route and just do a, um, a project with a conforming building height. Um, the trellis exceeds the building height limitation for the R15 zone district and the West Cliff Overlay Zone District. So the zoning ordinance does not allow that feature to exceed the height. Even though it's supporting energy generating equipment in the state of California, and it's not like, say, you know, a big chimney or something, isn't that different? Um, it can be. Um, the zoning ordinance allows an exception for um, for things that support or enclose like rooftop mechanical equipment. Um, we've typically interpreted that as that being the primary function of like that enclosure. Mm -hmm. Haven't really typically interpreted it as something that that you know primarily functions as a trellis or functions both as a trellis and as, um, as housing <clears throat> the PV structures. I had checked also with our green building specialist and he um, believed that that structure was not needed um, to house um, the photovoltaic 
electrical equipment, and he believed it could be placed directly onto the rooftop. So that's how we kind of thought through um, that piece of the puzzle and included the condition to have it removed. Okay, so it wasn't based on neighbor concerns or anything like that, to your knowledge? I think I did hear some concerns mm -hmm. um, about um, about things on the rooftop and um, but but the main but the main reason was the consistency with the code. Okay, that's a helpful explanation. So let me just be very clear if if we all agreed and we wanted to allow that, it's not a story of a building. It's not like an architectural feature. It's something you absolutely need to comply with the current building code in California. Um, can we just allow that if we wanted to? It's hmm. a good question. Sure, um, Eric, is that going to throw a big yes. wrench into uh, some sequel wheel I'm not thinking about? Speaking as a former zoning administrator, um, <laughs> um, you know, I think you would just need to make, if, if the majority of the commission wanted to support that feature, you would need to make the finding that um, there, there's a height limit modification section in the zoning core code. Uh, I'll read it to you. It says cupolas, scenery lofts, or other roof structures for the housing of elevators, stairways, tanks, ventilating fans, air conditioning, or similar equipment used solely to operate and maintain a building. So you would need to make a finding, I think, that this is appropriate. Um, uh, and and you did hear from Clara that we did, um, you know, explore that with our green building um, staff mm -hmm. and he felt like it wasn't necessary. But okay. if that's the direction you wanted to go, we'd probably include a finding um, to that effect. Okay. I agree with green building because there's probably enough space elsewhere to get the minimum amount of panels. What I want to do is enable the maximum amount of panels, and a trellis is a great way to do that. It seems to me like you can do it for an air conditioning unit. You can sure as hell do it for solar panels. So I do want to be careful to not upset the ship. Um, could I ask the applicant, is there any other problems with that solar trellis, you know, that I'm not thinking about? Or are you sitting there saying, oh, no, don't put it back in? So we could um, ask the applicant if they are still with us, um, if they could respond to the question about the solar trellis. Let's see, I'm looking at the list, they're still with us. You know, while we do that, you I, guys- Hi there. Oh, yeah. Okay, hi. great. Yeah, I am sorry, I had my hand raised, but it's- uh, it Oh, I didn't see it, sorry about that, we, Mr. Bernstein. We, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Kennedy, we would love to have the trails back if that's something that the uh, commission would agree to. Let me quickly ask on that. So is that to, not just for the infrastructure of the solar, but also you're saying uh, it's for both. residents I mean, it's could, for could be on the roof? Yeah, it's for shade and also to support the solar panels. For both. So it, okay. it would have a dual, it would have a dual purpose. Okay. Dual purpose. That's, okay. That's, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so on this topic, do we want to have, I know that Commissioner Schiffer and you had your hand up, but maybe other commissioners would like to speak to this point. Any thoughts on this particular question, just so that we don't lose it? Oh, we won't lose it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's hold on. Let's put that um, on a shelf. Let's remember this suggestion um, by Commissioner Kennedy. And then if there's no other comments on it, we'll go to Commissioner Schiffer now. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, let me first say that I feel positive about this project. I think it, the impacts of this project will certainly be um, much less than when the school was there in terms of um, both the uh, habitat areas and uh, you know and and uh, the you know the traffic, etc. So. Overall, I feel supportive of the project. I feel it's, it provides for a need that is important and great. Um, and so, you know, my only real concern with this project is, or with the staff recommendation on this project that concerns the uh, inclusion, the affordable units. 
Um, I think having a 3% affordability requirement is just unsupportable. And I understand the staff's logic, but I think it misinterprets the ordinance. And I've asked staff I've, uh, to have ready to add, to put up on the screen the language of section 2416.030.8, which is the section that deals with alternatives to the normal um, inclusionary requirements. So the staff is right that normally um, the inclusionary requirements are based on the number of uh, dwelling units in a project. But this isn't one of your normal projects. And the one of the alternatives really concerns um, congregate living units and assisted living units. And I think, as, you know, I think it's very clear in the ordinance that for these kinds of projects, another inclusionary requirement uh, exists. And I want to sort of go through this language. Uh, this is in the section on alternatives to the normal uh, inclusionary requirement. And it says congregate living units or assisted units. An applicant may propose to satisfy the inclusionary requirements of this chapter by providing congregate living units or assisted living units. So that's an option that um, may propose it. I would read that to say they should propose it if they are providing these units, but they may propose it. But then there's the second 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 sentence. And that says, if the approval body, which is us, determines that a proposed residential development project, which is the application, includes congregate living units or assisted living units, the following alternative requirements shall apply. And the one that's relevant is number A, 15% of the congregate care, congregate living or assisted living units shall be made available for rent to low income households at an affordable rent. And I think it's pretty clear that what the ordinance is saying is that these kinds of uh, senior developments that provide special <laughs> services uh, that have these congregate care living or, uh, units, assisted living units that are defined in the affordable um, uh, housing ordinance should have a you know should have inclusionary requirements and the developer can propose to impose these requirements or the approval body if it determines that a proposed residential uh, development includes such units the it shall apply a 15 percent uh inclusion uh, a 15 percent requirement that those units shall be made available for rent to lower low income households at an affordable rent. And I think there's a lot of evidence in the record that this is a community care facility and it should be subject to this requirement. Um, clearly the staff report talks about it that way, identifies the project as having a community care, uh, having community care and assisted living units numerous times. I don't think there's any argument that this is a uh, congregate care facility. In addition, the parking requirements are based on the fact that the project is a community congregate facility, uh, except for two apartment units. So in determining the number of units, it doesn't look at it as 13 apartment units uh, with two inclusionary units. It looks at it as only two apartment units and all the other beds are subject to this uh, lower parking requirement. Um, the project, uh, project units meet the definition of congregate care units in section 2416.015.9. And the code provides two ways for identifying a project as having congregate care units. As I said, the developer can propose it um, or uh, the approval body can make that determination. They are late, licensed by the state to provide assisted living unit services and Again, since congregate care facilities are different from senior housing developments with apartments, the code treats these requirements differently from dwelling units. So I think it's pretty clear that even though this uh, sentence is in the overall in the inclusionary uh, housing ordinance, 
it functions to just deal particularly with this um, with this kind of senior housing development with congregate care and assisted living units. So I'm willing to support a motion to approve this project. Um, I'm happy I'm, uh, and I'd be happy to include in that motion uh, the recommendations by both uh, Commissioner Messigi Miller and Commissioner Kennedy. Um, but I would also uh, add that um, the planning commission that the, there would be the following modification, which is as provided under section 2416030.8, the planning commission as an approval body for the project and based on substantial evidence, determines that the project includes congregate living units and assisted living units and is therefore subject to the requirement that 15% of the congregate care living or assisted living units shall be made available for rent to low income households at an affordable rent. Let me finally say that this provision would not uh, apply to the memory care units because they are not congregate care units and they're in, in, my, in my understanding or assisted living. They are you know, um, a, a different kind of unit that's being offered in a congregate care facility, but I don't think would be um, included under this provision in the code. So anyway, that's that's my um, that's my recommendation to the commission that uh, we approve the project, but we approve the project such that uh, we determine that this that the congregate care and assisted living units. Uh, meet the affordability requirements as indicated in that code section. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Schifrin. Um, yes, um, Planner Stanger. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to provide a little bit of staff clarification on this point. Um, so there are two um, different ways of complying with the inclusionary ordinance. The first way is by um, following the standard requirements. And the second way is by um, choosing to um, apply for an alternative method. Um, so the basic, these are the standard, the basic requirements, basic onsite inclusionary housing requirements, 2416.020 for this project. Um, point five applies rental residential developments with five or more dwellings. Um, um, would shall provide 20% of the dwelling units as inclusionary units. So that's how we came up with that. 13 of the units are dwelling units and 20% of that um, is the two units. Um, and then 2416.030 that states, this is the start of the alternative method section. So if the applicant does not want to follow the standard inclusionary requirement, um, they may um, apply to um, use one of these alternative methods. And then this section 2416.030 lists out all of those methods that the applicant may apply for. And number eight is the congregate living units or assisted living units. So the applicant has to apply to, um, to use this alternative method as opposed to using standard method. And the applicant did not apply to use this alternative method. So um, we've um, looked at this with our city attorney and they agree that this is the appropriate way to, um, um, to, to read this part of the code. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin. I understand that that's the staff point of view. I, I think it's very disappointing that uh, the staff and the city attorney uh, consistently uh, decide to interpret the ordinance to minimize the number of inclusionary units when that is not necessary. I think, as I said, that this section provides an alternative that normally uh, for other kinds of projects, it's clear that the alternatives are at the discretion of the applicant. In this particular case, it very clearly states that the approval body has the ability, has the authority to determine 
that a proposed residential development includes these kinds of units. And if that determination is made, and I think it's appropriate to make it in this case, then the alternative requirements um, apply. I, you know, I, I understand that Steph does not agree with that, but I think it is a very reasonable and legal uh, the uh, interpretation of the ordinance. And to not interpret it this way is essentially setting up a situation where what no developer is going to decide that they want to have a uh, that they want to use this section if it's going to mean that they're going to have a 15% requirement. Um, that sentence is put in there, I believe, with the intention of requiring congregate care and assisted living developments, living unit developments, to meet inclusionary requirements, not to. Um, not to avoid them. And what we see is a recommendation where we have a 3% affordability requirement at a time when we have a crisis in affordable housing, when lower income seniors have uh, very, very few choices, especially if they need uh, assisted living. And if we interpret the code the way uh, the staff report is, is recommending, we're essentially um, making it impossible for these lower income seniors to ever live in these kinds of facilities because there's no incentive for the developer of them to ever define themselves as, uh, uh, as a congregate care assisted living facility. But the code doesn't require that. The code gives the approval body that ability to um, determine that the development includes these units and therefore is subject to those units should be subject to a 15% low income requirement. So I'm willing to, um, okay, I see that Mr. Marlett wants to respond. Yeah. Um, so, and I just wanted to quickly um, respond as well um, that it is concerning that there are these two avenues that can be taken, one of which if you have, you know, a slightly smaller refrigerator and, you know, microwave versus an additional hot plate um, and a slightly smaller sink means it doesn't qualify as a, you know, as a, as a kitchen or a kitchenette or what have you, which are not even uh, accounted for in the plans. Uh, and if you go the other route, um, you know, there's a way of, of interpreting this code to, uh, to all similarly avoid uh, this, the same kind of even uh, less of, of an inclusionary requirement, uh, but sim certainly an inclusionary requirement that, uh, that, that could be interpreted um, in this alternative methods of, of compliance. Um, so it seems like there's this kind of circuitous route that's been taken to avoid a basic level of um, of inclusionary that's so needed. A, a second thing I would point out is uh, the lack of inclusion in, in this discussion and a, a response to the question, which which might have been raised earlier about uh, you know how much it's going to cost to live in this in this development um, and the need for twelve thousand fourteen thousand um, monthly. Uh, down and then the monthly the monthly costs not being accounted for and and no kind of attention to what the needs are for seniors in our community and whether there's been an analysis. Um, my understanding is that there's high levels of poverty amongst the senior population and a need for um, senior assisted living and inclusionary, uh, particularly for the senior population and a lack and whether there's been an analysis done of the availability of, of senior facilities and the availability of affordable senior facilities in our community, whether that analysis has been done in the context of, of approving this development and thinking about our role as planners and planning commission in really trying to incentivize a for-profit senior living development um, that would include basic level of inclusionary um, and really um, think about the spirit of the law here uh, in terms of, of doing that. So um, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Mollett. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to add a little bit to what, what Clara mentioned. Um, if you look at the, um, the sort of the preamble to this ordinance, it's 2416-20, it's applicability of the ordinance. It talks about um, what projects are subject um, to the inclusionary. Um, it talks about dwelling units. We already have spent quite a bit of time talking about what is a dwelling unit and what isn't. It also includes SROs and SOUs. Um, it does not say anything about congregate care facility. And, and I point that out because SROs do allow uh, projects that have common kitchen areas. Um, so it, it clearly applies to a similar type of project. It doesn't apply here. You know, so then the next question becomes, well, why um, can congregate care be uh, applied for as an inclusionary alternative? A very good question. Um, I think there's a couple of explanations. Um, the first being um, hybrid projects. I mean, in theory, if there were a project that had a greater ratio of self-contained units um, and the kitchenettes, the applicant may want to propose some of those congregate uh, units to be inclusionary, and then that would require planning commission approval. Um, the other thing to note is that the um, if you go the route of congregate um, as an alternative, it's only a 15% inclusionary as opposed to the 20% um, that applies to standard projects. And so I believe um, it requires planning commission review and approval to make sure that it is in fact a congregate care facility and that conditions can be imposed um, to ensure it is what it is. So um, that's the other explanation. But but bottom line, again, as I said earlier, we, we share that desire to maximize um, affordability here. Um, we just did not see a legal way and we did drill down as much as we could with our legal staff. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Marla and uh, Commissioner Schick. Um, one small thing, um, they're no longer uh, SOU units. Um, and so I think the code needs to be changed to um, put in flexible density units, because I think those were those are now what would uh, be substituted for them. Um, the SROs are still in the code. I know, I'm not saying SROs, I'm saying SOUs. Yeah. Gotcha. Good, good. So you are no longer yeah. in the code, correct? Thank you. Okay. So a couple of things. One, the inclusionary ordinance is about providing affordable housing. And normally affordable housing is provided through the creation of dwelling units that have, you know, the the you know, what we think of as dwelling units. Um, congregate care units and assisted living units have their own, um, have their own definition in the code. They are, um, they, as the applicant indicated, they uh, are licensed by the state. And my sense is how do you deal with them if you want them to have affordable housing requirements? Well, you know, the, Council could have, uh, the, the code could have had a special section on uh, congregate care facilities, um, but that wasn't the approach that was taken. The approach that was taken was to allow the uh, applicant to um, determine that they're congregate care facilities or to allow the approval body to determine that they're congregate care facilities. Both of these apply. I'm always you know, it's our, this is the code. One of our jobs is to, the, you know, is to interpret the code. And, as, and in my sense is as long as the interpretation is legal and is reasonable and is based on substantial evidence, I think, um, I would hope that the role of the city attorney is to, to support that interpretation. So, um, I appreciate the city attorney's advice. I don't think it is really um, um, accurate 
when it comes to interpreting this code section. And based on that, I would like to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation with the following modifications. The um, added direction as proposed by Commissioner C.D. Miller, um, making the findings as proposed for the solar panel trellis, if I understood what that was all about, uh, from Commissioner Kennedy. And um, as provided under section 2416030.8 of the zoning uh, ordinance, the Planning Commission as an approval body for the project and based on substantial evidence determines that the project includes congregate care living units and assisted living units and is therefore subject to the requirement that 15% of the congregate living or assisted living unit shall be made available for rent to low income households at an affordable rent. That's my motion. I would, I would second that motion with the addition, if it's okay, a friendly amendment to include Ms. City Miller's uh, uh, inclusion as to what he said in his original motion. Original I did motion. I did add that. Okay. That I, I, didn't I, didn't give the, I didn't give all the language because I didn't remember it. But and I, I would second that motion. Okay. So now I think we have a discussion of the motion on the floor. Um, Commissioner Kennedy. So I appreciate the intent of, of Mark Masidi Miller's language on the right turn. My concern is that it's designed to fail because both fire and everyone will say, oh no, you gotta go right to get to a fire, right? So what I was thinking about, and I'm not a traffic engineer, was like a bulb out in the parking spot just to the right of that driveway. And this is the only chance for Pelton to ever get any bulb outs, improvements, et cetera, right? This project, or maybe the church later. So that's what I was thinking. I don't know how others feel about it. I feel that the neighbors like should be involved in that decision. And maybe Ralph Myberg would be a good person that you know staff and public works could could talk to to make sure it's gonna work. I did not mean to suggest like that we shut off Pelton in one direction because that will We've seen that turn out all the rest of the West Club neighbors again and again. So I just want to clarify that. Um, and then Eric, do you have everything you need for that solar trellis thing? The intent is to use that air conditioning language to allow that solar trellis up on top. And can you take it from there? Yes, and I'd likely at the, at the commission's um, blessing, um, augment the findings to, to, to indicate that that you made that interpretation as a commission. Cool. That's the intent of the motion. Okay. So I got one more very soft, uh, friendly amendment uh, for the makers of the motion to consider. I think this is happening already, but you know, we might as well put it in there, um, I think. And what I wrote was that this project shall make every effort feasible to create landscapes which will support a thriving monarch population. And you know, I think this is happening already and it's pretty soft and hard to enforce, but I would love to stick that in there. You know, like we had monarchs on our wedding invitation. I love monarchs, so. Well, let me just ask Steph whether that is, provides anything in addition to what is already in the conditions of, a, the various conditions of approval, because there are a lot of conditions of approval that related to the monarch. And I thought some of them involved the landscaping. So I, I'm not sure whether um, I, I would ask staff whether I don't have an objection to that uh, additional condition, but I just wonder whether it really is necessary, whether it really provides anything meaningful else. Right. I would just add there was a concern a number of people mentioned about lighting. Um, well, let's get an answer to this. But, so that's just an example. Landscape. Yeah, and and then the question about whether that's already included. Right. These kinds of things are already included. It is already um, proposing landscaping that includes uh, several plant species that can be used for foraging. And then in addition, we have included um, conditions of approval, for example, um, like for the water fountain um, or the butterfly garden um, to provide a water source. Um, 
it maybe it doesn't hurt to include a catch-all condition in case the applicant thinks of more things they want to add in. But um, but there are already um, based on what the project is proposing and conditions, there are um, quite a few things already in place. I'm happy to add, you know, the more general language. Um, although, you know, it's kind of meaningless because the, the applicant will decide if anything's feasible or not. And so, I, you know, I, but if you would like it in, I would be willing to add it to the motion. I don't know. Let's if it's in there already, we can drop it. It's yeah. not going to be enforceable anyway. I just, I, I'm sorry, I'm just making a political grandstand because it's all this like, oh, we're going to like mitigate the damage and yada yada. We need to change our conversation to restoring and like helping and supplementing. So um, I'm done grandstanding and I will retract that friendly amendment. Okay. I hear the concern and that uh, I, from some things I think that Jillian Greensight mentioned, by the way, um, about the fountain is not actually effective for the, I don't know, <laughs> for the butterflies. And I guess I'm wondering to what degree, um, you know, butterfly ecologists are involved in this, uh, you know, uh, this is the decision making around this and to what degree the, you know, the developer, you know, how, who's being consulted and who has a, a say uh, in these mitigations relating to the monarchs um, to, to well, ensure that they're really going to uh, require the uh, applicant to consult with the uh, butterfly habitat expert um, in preparing the landscaping plans. And Can we say that? Yeah. To incorporate recommendations from um, that person in the in those plans and have them approved by the city staff. Is there any reason why that would not be an acceptable addition? That's a good idea, Andy. They have a really good team, and I think that will happen anyway, like moving into construction doc. But um, yeah. that's a better way to say what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So is that accept if if the staff doesn't object, is that acceptable to the second the uh, seconder? Yeah, that's acceptable. Great. We have some great, some preeminent monarch butterfly ecologists in our community. Good. Um, did it, I think uh, Clara Clara Stanger? Yes, Planner Stanger. Sorry, real quick. Um, I've been um, taking notes on the, the proposed um, conditions. Do you mind if I just share my screen? Just um, Yes, thank you. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I can make sure I'm getting it right for you guys. First one is a more substantial traffic component. Oh. Is there any way that I think we changed the last one. Um, I think this was the original one, and I think it was changed more to um, the applicant shall consult with a um, butterfly ecologist um, in preparing the landscaping plans to um, make every effort to uh, have the landscape support a thriving butterfly, monarch butterfly population. Uh, and the plans to be approved by the staff. And I would change the third one slightly um, the, to the, that the planning commission determines um, 
based on substantial evidence that the project includes congregate care in the following. Oh, you sort of had that. Okay. Any I, have one, I have one suggestion on the first item. Uh, my original language included, it was a more substantial traffic control device. Shall be installed to prevent vehicles from making a right turn. That's perfect. When exiting the facility onto Pelton Avenue. Um, thank you. Great. Um, thank you. Am I? Yeah. Uh, and I, in this is very helpful to share this. I think we were, we all um, agree that this is the language that people have provided. And now I see Commissioner Maxwell has his hand up. Yeah, I think. I'm really happy that we're all working on this together. And yeah. um, I think this is it's great that we've heard from the community and um, we're, you know, moving forward. I think the, the only thing that I don't want to um, forget and make sure that it's included, if everybody feels concerned, it might be included, included in the fourth bullet point. And, and that's regarding the lighting issue. Um, around the nighttime lighting yes. that's been brought up by multiple um, community members. And I don't know if that seems like something we want to include in there, but I would like to just bring that point forward. Yeah, that might not be understood as, as landscaping. So is there, right. um, Commissioner Maxwell, do you have any other language you would suggest? Um, I mean, I think I would want to just maybe open that up to the commission and in general, if anybody has, I mean, if, 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 if we all feel like we agree with that, then maybe we can, but you know, that's just where I'm at. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think it was commissioner Kennedy and then the CD Miller, if I got that right. Uh, Sean, I totally agree. I think it's really well covered by code and pretty well shown in the plans. I took, it's hard to, it's 570 pages of plans, but uh, there's one that shows the lighting plan. And given what I know, I took a look and it looked pretty good. Also, the energy code has some pretty good um, requirements for this already. So uh, if you want to add, I'm happy to accept it, but I think it's in there pretty strongly already. Okay. Okay. Um, and I guess it could just say preparing the landscaping and lighting plans. That could be the language potentially if we agree. Um, Commissioner Masidi Miller and then Commissioner, I mean, and then Planner Marlott. Yeah, I, I just wanna, um, I was gonna say pretty much exactly what uh, Commissioner Kennedy said. I've read through these conditions. There is a condition in the conditions on this project that requires all lighting to be down only, shielded, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think it's a non-issue. Um, I don't have any objections. Do you want? If you want to add another one, I just think it's you know it's just being too, too duplicative and unnecessary. I mean, I um, just to respond. I guess there is a question. Um, I'm not sure the degree to which all the members of the public read through those, but if they did, maybe they felt like they hadn't consulted with somebody who really knew what was going on with butterflies um, to the degree necessary. You know that some of the suggestions made weren't you know, relevant for, you know, that it wasn't foraging, it was overwintering. I mean, I'm, I'm not an oncologist, so I'm not sure, but perhaps they wanted like a more of an independent consultant, um, uh, an ecologist uh, and, and the staff to, to look at those questions about 
landscaping as well as lighting. Um, but perhaps we don't think that's necessary. I'm not sure. Well, the language um, already includes um, landscape and lighting plans. So I don't know what, what more we could do. And that, that we added lighting. Um, oh, that okay, great. Added for that reason. No and it should be added also uh, to make every effort to make the landscape and lighting support a thriving butterfly. And then also right, yeah. in the third one, there should be a that um, in front of the project includes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, Commissioner Maxwell, are you okay with this change to the uh, to the motion? I am. I, I so and I accept it as a friendly amendment to add the lighting into that fourth bullet. Okay, um, so uh, I think we may be, oh, I see a, a comment and response by Planner Stanger. Thank you. I was just wondering if you wanted to include in the motion the additional conditions um, and modified conditions that were proposed by staff. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, that should be part of the motion, that, but, but it's part of the staff recommendation at this point. So um, by a the motion is to approve the staff recommendation and that includes the staff recommended modifications. Thank you. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, if there are no other, oh, I see, okay, uh, Commissioner Kennedy. So does this project need three votes to pass or four? Three. It needs a majority of the commission. That's what I thought. Commissioner is present. It's not Commissioner an ordinance President. change. Okay. It's Commissioner President. I think, unless Eric tells me I'm wrong, but I think that no, that's you're correct. Point. It's the majority of the commissioners present. Commissioners present. It's getting late, Eric. I should have known that one. <laughs> okay, good question. Um, all right. Can we vote? I think we're ready for a vote. Can we get a uh, roll call, please? Commissioner Kennedy? Uh, regrettably, no, only because of the affordable housing thing. Um, Maxwell? Aye. Dee, Dee Miller? You're muted, Mark. I have to vote no as well. I just cannot um, go along with the affordable housing piece when staff is advising us that they uh, drill down with legal counsel on this matter and uh, could not find support for this. So I, I'm gonna vote no. Uh, Schifrin? Aye. Vice Chair Greenberg? Uh, aye. There you have it. Cool. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think that the, the motion passes. And we uh, can, can, I think we now move on uh, rather than continue to discuss. Um, and uh, are there any, am I supposed to ask if there, if there's anything else on this matter or do we just, we just, no, we just go on. Dude. We just move on. Okay. So next. Um, and I would just say that um, I really appreciate all the work that the applicants and the planning staff put into this and how important this development is. And I really appreciate that we're going to um, revisit the question um, of all of the uh, all of the elements of this motion, including the affordability, given how crucial it is for our community and in particular our seniors. Um, so, um, and that I, I, and I agree with uh, Commissioner Schifrin's interpretation, of course, that I think it, it could be interpreted as, as legal. So I uh, would like to move on then and just going to my agenda here and go to information items. 
Are there any information items the staff would like to bring to us? Uh, thank you. I just wanted to mention that we do have business for your next meeting, um, which is on October 20th. Um, there's two items, one involving a right away abandonment on the west side and the other um, involves uh, amendments to the cannabis ordinance. So uh, we will have business. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then next, um, are there Can any... Can I ask a question? Oh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Sorry, Marlin, are there any enough. other projects that are lining up to come before us in the next couple of months? Uh, yeah, I know the library uh, project is getting close to um, uh, requiring a hearing. We have a couple of other mixed-use projects that are also um, complete and or in the environmental review stage. So, yeah, we do have a couple also. Would the library project come before us, assuming Measure uh, O fails, uh, without an EIR being done first? Why would what would we be hearing on that project? It, it, the entitlements, um, and we would be doing environmental review on it, um, like we would any other project. Oh, so you think that could be done that quickly? Okay, great. Uh, okay. Um, and so if there are no other questions about information items, okay, seeing none, we are going to move on to um, subcommittee advisory body oral reports. There are none. We have no subcommittees. Okay. We have none. There are none. So are there any items that people would like referred to future agendas? I don't know if this is an agenda item, but... Um... I've been watching that huge building that I happily voted for being built downtown. And I wondered if uh, it'd be fun to go on a tour of that sometime as a commission. We did some tours before, like on the downtown plan. It was great for morale and camaraderie. And like, I don't think we've all seen each other physically in person yet, right? So I don't know, just had that idea that that might be kind of fun and we'll see how those projects are coming together if anyone else was interested. Uh, what you do is just publicly notice it as a meeting, and then that's that. And, you know, I, hard hats aside, but I just had that thought that I'd throw it out there. Great idea. Yeah. Uh, I would like, I support that. I think it would be good to look at the affordable housing projects as well. Yeah. Uh, the Pacific Station South, I think, might be far enough along that you know, at least we should visit the site. Some of us were at the groundbreaking, and maybe the the project adjacent to the church, that's that's something that's being built pretty quickly as well. This is really great. I didn't even know that was something we could do. So we can notice that and then we get to go on this tour and the public can join us or how does that work? Which just us? That's what we did before, like not to get around, but to honor the Brown Act and, you know, have it be a meeting. Yes. And it was very effective. You've already you want, acted on, you want so. it to be under control and not just be like some big free for all, but yeah. Um, for me, it's so helpful to like look at these things and especially talk with you all about it. Yeah. You know, how do apartments work? I grew up in a single family house. I don't know. I lived in an apartment for like a year in college, you know, so just seeing these units, <laughs> I think would really help us start to feel these things more. Not to mention the views off that thing, you know, you can see like right into UCSC up there, so. <laughs> I know from time to time, um, developers will do ribbon cutting ceremonies. And I think we did this very thing with the 1010 Pacific project where commissioners and council members were invited and, you know, there were tours and whatnot. So we could certainly um, look into that on those big projects. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, getting to know the downtown plan more um, is going to be really helpful for us. And we're getting lots of questions from the public about it. So um, I think that's a great idea. So let's think about um, putting that on a, um, making a future meeting of, out of that. Um, and uh, I don't know how that would be coordinated or. Um, it's not even really a meeting. The Brown Act doesn't really preclude you from socializing as long as you're not talking mm -hmm. about anything that's gonna come before you. And those are things that I already have. Right, 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 right. Okay, so we can just organize it amongst ourselves. I'm sure the city would want to do something just to be open, but yeah, uh, I'm sure yeah. staff will deal with that. Staff will help us. Okay. And we're having a report with how we did it before, if that's helpful. I think we called it a study session 
but there's a way to do it. Okay. Can we get a report on that at our next meeting? So we can actually talk about it? Yeah, that's a good idea. And then we can let the public know what's planned and stuff like that. Good. Um, cool idea. All right. Any other items referred to future agendas? Okay. Well, seeing none, I think I'm going to call our meeting to adjournment. Thank you all very much. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Nice to see you all. Bye. And Bye. great job tonight, Commissioner Greenberg on running the <laughs> Totally. Thank you. We made it through. <laughs>